Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Essays in Espresso podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about does authorial intent really matter? But before that, here are our hosts. Acer, hey, how are you doing? Uh, poorly. You have you have stolen the uh, hosting duties away from me again. Oh, uh, well, I'm sorry, but you just didn't do a very good job. True. Better luck next time. And Boken, how are you? Also poorly, but for different also reasons. Poorly. Man... Why, why are you two such sour pusses all of a sudden? What's going on here? And oh, someone's calling you. Get... How professional of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is every Hello? every time. And then he just answers it. I don't know. Okay. Right. Well, it may be his mother, Bogan. We don't know. Speaking of which, I should probably put my phone on silence, shouldn't yes, I? Should... Okay. Actually, I should too. My phone, my phone is now on Do Not Disturb. Man. What an intro. Yes. Amazing. Good job, everybody. Amazing. I am your host, Daniel. You're an amazing host. Better than Acer. Oh. And what's today's topic, Daniel? Did you already say it? I, I, already, <laughs> I already, already said, said it. it. I already said <laughs> Jesus. It. <laughs> oh. But um, since... Wow, Acer, you don't have much to talk about today. No. You're, you're literally, you only, you only have one. So. Yes. I literally have okay. four topics plus Acer's topic. Wow. Yeah. Well, and uh, you wanted to make this a short now. one. Yeah. I'm going to keep myself short. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I'll go first. So I read, and I, I need to be very specific here. I read this okay. book there this, is this, no this audiobook audio book? version you can read oh. there is no there is no audiobook version of this book oh it, it it literally exists only as a book imagine reading books yes so i read um silent hill 2 which is part of the boss fight books series Ooh. Yes, so this is a book that is basically in an analysis of Silent Hill 2, mm. and it's really damn good. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. It's written by a comedian named Mike Drucker, mm. and a lot of the book has to do with um, talking about the the development of the game, um, how... Uh, fans have like interacted with the game um it goes a little bit into like uh you know talking about the developers but it is predominantly a just an analysis of the game it goes deep into uh the story the themes it, it breaks down certain scenes in the game so i would say like if you are a fan of silent hill 2 it is well worth picking up is it better um, is it better than my video on it well considering i could actually see the game while watching your video your your video wins yes also because you don't need to actually read it you can just listen to it that that too that but that that's is reading, also a point isn't it <laughs> all poking now, yes, the the advantage or disadvantage, depending on your disposition, is that it is a book. Does the book does the book ever cite me? Because I saw you <laughs> tweeted they cite uh they cited <laughs> no because they cited Ragnaroks, didn't they? I saw yeah. you tweet that. Yeah, I was actually half expecting your video to come up, but it didn't. I'm sorry. Those rat bastards. If it makes you feel any better, that is the only video that was referenced. The other references were to other books and articles written about Silent Hill 2. It doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so vain, you guys. Um, well, right now, the, you can buy the Kindle version for five bucks. 
And I mean, for five bucks, I'd say it's definitely worth it. It's, it's honestly a really good read. I really, really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually started reading it again because I liked it so much. It was really good. Um, the way that he breaks down certain things and the way that his his observations I found to be uh, really interesting because I I always felt that like everything that could be said about Silent Hill 2 has already been said. And this book kind of proved me wrong. It made me realize, no, there's still stuff to talk about in Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill 2 is just the gift that keeps on giving. Mm-hmm. And there's there's so much to this series and Silent Hill 2 especially. Can so, I uh, can I say something yeah. about Silent Hill 3? Now, maybe maybe I'm being, uh, again, vain, petty. Maybe I'm uh, claiming ownership over something I have no ownership over. Um, okay. I, when I made my video on it, I, I said something, and this was my own original thought. I had never seen anybody discuss this anywhere before. I said, it is a lot more like Silent Hill 2 than you think, except it shifts the masculine-feminine dynamics so it's not like, so Silent Hill 2 has a lot of men who exert power and the damage that happens because of that. You have Eddie, you have James and what happens uh, with him and his wife, you have uh, Angela's father and brother, whereas in Silent Hill 3, it's way more feminine. It's about like maternity mm-hmm. and stuff. I made this observation and I'd never seen anyone make it before. And every Silent Hill 3 video that I've watched since has made this observation, and no one has credited me for being... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, For making... That is quite funny. For making what is actually a pretty obvious uh, (laughs) observation. I feel like people don't credit people in this essay space anyway. Nah, that's true. I just, uh, I feel, that's I feel like, true. <laughs> I feel like I was the one who, that's like my gift to the world. That's the one observation I made, which was worth anything. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, uh, there, I was trying to find it in the book itself, but I, I'll just try to recite it from memory. But there was one scene in particular that I really liked. This is, Slight spoilers for Silent Hill 2. I'll try to dance around as much as I can. But uh, there's the scene. There's a scene where um, James finds Pyramid Head like sexually assaulting some monsters, and then he's like, uh, he hides in the closet. Um, and the observation that um, that Mike makes in this part, I thought was really interesting. Where like he's he's blatantly pointing out like yes james is hiding from the uh the violent sexual action that is happening in front of him just like he's hiding from his own sexual and violent past and i was like wow that's a really keen observation hmm you've just spoiled the game for me Oh no! <laughs> I mean, I did not give any details, but that's true. Does, did they make? Yeah, a, there's, even I know. A, even I know what the secret is, and I've never played it. Did they make a game? Did they make a book on Silent Hill Three? No. Could you? This is yeah. Could just you? Silent Hill yeah, 2. yeah, yeah. Could you message them and be like, "Hey, when you do Silent Hill Three, please cite Acer. He's very vain." Well, you what you can do is you can call him up and see if you want to write the book yourself. Oh, no. Because <laughs> all, all these boss fight books are written by different people. Oh, uh, no, maybe they have a Maybe they have a p- Patreon that you can support and then have your name show up that way. Oh. Uh, there, there's a book on Earthbound. There's a book on Chrono Trigger, which I read that one. That one was not as good as the Silent Hill 2 one, but it was still pretty Shots decent. Shots fired. Uh, there's one on uh, Bible Adventures. That one was actually really <laughs> in- entertaining. That was that one was pretty good. Nice. Um, they have one on Shadow of the Colossus, which I plan on reading next. Uh, they've got one on Kingdom Hearts 2, Katamari Damacy, Shovel Knight, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, 
So how much do you get paid for writing one of those books? I don't know. I, I would imagine it, it uh, it's tied to how well they sell, mm. but I don't know for sure. Mm. I don't know. It sounds like they um, vary in quality. They do because they're all written by different people. I feel like I so, could write a terrible book about this and make a cheap buck. So, uh, like I said, uh, Silent Hill 2, awesome book. Chrono Trigger 1, pretty decent. Uh, it's got some good stuff in it, some other stuff I wasn't as into. And the Bible Adventures 1, really entertaining, uh, well worth checking out. Uh, the rest of them I can't comment on, I haven't gone through them yet, but I do want to get through the... KOTOR and Shadow of the Colossus ones especially. Ooh. But yeah. But yeah. Um What if what if the only reason Ragnarok's was cited was because he secretly wrote the book? <gasps> he didn't. I'll have to ask him. I just him. told you I just told you who the author was. I'll have to I, ask I, him. I forgot. I'm, I think I'm I didn't to hear do it. a video with him. His is uh, the author is Mike Drucker who is a comedian. He's like a well-known oh, comedian. Okay. Mike Drucker. So anyways, uh, aside from that, I've also been playing Near Replicant. So this is a remaster slash kind of sort of remake of the original Near, which came out, I think, 2010. Mm -hmm. So the original, there's a bit of a storied history here. So the original Near... When it released in Japan, it released as Near Replicant for the PS3 and Near Gestalt on the Xbox 360. The only real difference between these two versions is that Near Replicant you played as <clears throat> you played as a younger version of the character who is um, a brother to his sister Yona, while in Gestalt you play as a father to his daughter Yona. That and and that's the only real difference. Oh, oh. Every time, every time I hear about Nier, every time I hear about Drakengard, it's just like these these layers, these unnecessary layers of complexity. My mind, I can't. Here's here's the thing. Here's the thing. I hope this will make you feel better. Yoko Taro did not initially intend for it to be that way. Someone from marketing. Told oh him, my God. you know, <laughs> yes. Someone in marketing said, you know, uh, Western fans, um, they don't have are brothers gonna and sisters. They're not going to want to play as this you know, cute little Bishonen boy. They want to play as a manly man. And then Yoko Taro was like, "Oh, you motherfuckers! Okay, <laughs> fine, whatever." But marketing was right. We in the West, no, were... <laughs> we we in the West, we both hate oh, no, little remember, cute but... shonen boys, and we hate creators. Give us big burly men from marketing. <laughs> so yeah, he kind of like very slapdashedly just put the father character in Gestalt, and when the game was released over here, we only got near Gestalt. We didn't get the brother character at all outside of some DLC that's completely gameplay focused mm -hmm. so we we pretty much missed out on brother near entirely um so now with this re-release which is not, again it's not it's not quite a remaster it's not quite a remake it's kind of somewhere in between i lean closer to it being a remake because they went out of their way to improve the combat the the graphics look better the game has been relocalized um obviously now that we're playing as brother near um that's also for us especially in the west that's that's different um there's also new content they there was stuff that they uh that was cut from the original game that they have now uh implemented so that's cool and they also added a new ending that ties itself more strongly to near automata one so, day uh one day i will finish near automata uh, so i gravely underestimated how much of a difference playing as the brother character would make so the brother character fits so much better with the story mm -hmm. and it, there's a lot of little things that i kind of 
didn't think about or kind of dismissed in my mind when I played the original that now playing as a brother character, I'm like, oh, thinking back, that was kind of weird or that didn't really make sense. So like, like there, there's some like, there's some lines of dialogue in particular where like fucking old man, 35, 40 year old, whatever, Papa Nier is like, we're friends, Kaine. Which sounds so weird, but when you see this fifteen-year-old like Bishonen boy say it, it's like, it's like, oh yeah, that fits, <laughs> that makes sense. And even other little things were like, uh, in the beginning of the game, in particular, you do side quests that are just these little odd jobs that the villagers give the main character to help him make some money so that he could take care of his little sister. And, you know, since he's a young kid, he's like 15 or whatever, he can't, he's not old enough to like hold like a steady job. It makes sense that they would like come together to take care of him like this. What fucking sense does it make for them to do this for like a 35, 40 year old man? Like get a job, you bum. <laughs> Just like a burnout. <laughs> so like... Yeah, there's just like a bunch of little things now that just was slightly off in the original. And now it's just like, oh, okay, that makes way more sense now. And I a lot I think because the 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 story was so good and the characters were so good that my mind kind of just like, eh, didn't really kind of just dismissed it and kinda of didn't really think about it in the original. But mm -hmm. now it's just like, yeah, no, this 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 was meant for this character. It it it, it the story feels like I'm, I'm finally seeing the story the way it was meant to be told yeah was it good so yeah i am greatly enjoying it um it's it's both it, it's it's still very faithful to the original game in a lot of ways like it still feels like the same game just polished like i think um someone put it best where they basically said that it felt like they actually got to finish the game. Hmm. Like, it's still very much the same game, but, like, it's done now. Yeah. So I would uh, I would strongly recommend playing this over the original version. Um, I do kind of still like Papa Nier. I, th I think he has, a like, a weird sort of charm to him, but I can't... <laughs> ever recommend that the original version over this one this is the definitive version by far in pretty much every way um it looks better it plays better um and the already great story is now made just a little bit better all right are they making another near game do you know uh, there's like a mobile game but oh, I, i'm yeah, not paying yeah. attention to that um are they, are they I, gonna I make a sequel uh, on automata they haven't said anything about that, no. Hmm. Like, they probably will just because Automata was such, a, like, a huge fucking moneymaker. And apparently Replicant is also doing very well, uh, too. Like, apparently it's, like, a, it's charting on Steam. So, apparently it's selling pretty good, too. Hmm. Cool. But, yeah, they haven't announced anything official. So, yeah. Near Replicant's fucking awesome. Uh... The Silent Hill 2 boss fight book is fucking awesome. Go get him. Hey, sir, what have you been up to? Uh, I thought we were going to do Pokken, and then we could just finish on Resident Evil 8. Why? We should have okay. started on Resident Evil 8. <laughs> okay, well, uh, so Resident Evil 8 came out, uh, and I'm sort of a... I'm not a Resident Evil fan, but I like the series. I've played some of the games... Uh, and I haven't played others. I didn't play Resident Evil 8 because I've been very busy, but I watched a uh, a stream of it while I was editing. So I was very sour on this game because I thought uh, uh, Mommy Milkers was going to be like <laughs> the main thing. And it was just like, I, I thought it was, I thought this was going to be like, oh, we're just like pandering to internet horn. No, 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 no. She, she's barely in the game. Um, so, so you thought she was going to be, this was going to be like Resident Evil, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis where like, yeah, she's just yeah. going to be stalking you the whole game. Th that's what I thought it was. But 
It's not. It's uh, it's way better. It's so. Um, did you guys play Bogan? You should maybe jump in since this is a mutual topic. Did you guys play Resident Evil Seven? Yeah, I beat it. Okay. Um, to anybody, okay. Like- so Resident Evil Eight is doing really well sales wise. So everyone listening probably uh, will have played it. Who cares? But we're gonna spoil it, um, for them, right? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So Resident Evil 7, uh, just like a bit of historical context, a real return to form for a franchise. Um, I feel like that game grounded, well, it wasn't grounded in like a reality, but it was It was way more localized than the Resident Evils had become, where it was just like, it's this one family and there was like a ship. It's not the world is in danger. I feel like Resident Evil 8 is in many ways, a really good improvement on Resident Evil 7, but I do kind of dislike how much bigger in scope it is. Bogan, do you agree on that? I I don't think this game is that big in scope, though. I mean, Mm -hmm. yeah, you're kind of going from a house to a village. Yeah, but it's like a little shitty village. (laughs) it's, it's It's still isolated, but I mean more in the sense... They, like, they, not just uh, in... At the end, they kind of hint towards some bigger conspiracies that are probably coming next. Yeah, and... But I, I, I just, wait, I just... Real quick, I just want to touch on, like... You were like, we went from a house to a village, and it's like... <laughs> I love the implication of just, like, let's just do seven again, but bigger. More houses. <laughs> <laughs> I had tweeted out that Resident Evil 9 can only be called Resident Evil 9 Skateboard Tricks IX to ra- to maintain the naming conventions. Um, but I, but I, I wouldn't nine at this point just be Resident Evil City. Like I, what's bigger than a village? A but city? that's but that's Resident Evil Two, <laughs> Resident Evil Two and Three. Oh, that's right. We already had Operation Raccoon City. Yeah, also that. The the <laughs> No, but I when uh, I say I, uh, uh, uh when I say st- I actually wait, I actually beat that fucking game. Oh my god. That game why? is fucking horrible. Why would that you game do is that? Fucking ter- Cuz I was playing it between me and like three other friends. We all beat it together. <laughs> that game is ungodly terrible. <laughs> like just pure trash. Um yeah, I believe it. Just for a moment, uh, what can they do with a name? to go into IX for nine. Tricks. Dominatrix? Are for kids. Dominatrix. Uh, Flicks? Netflix? It can be a Netflix special! A Netflix movie! We did it, boys. Sex, where they, they just glow the part of the E. Oh! Oh yeah, we're not even <laughs> thinking, Bogan. They can just glow parts of other letters, like they, they did to the L and Village. Lame. That's what they did with Village. Yeah. Yeah. But still. They can do they can do Resident Evil Anxiety and do the I from uh, the N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up, n- no, not obnoxious. You can't do that. Resident mm. Evil Anxiety. I think that's probably the best they're gonna cook up. No. Well, to find it's... a better one, without making this. Episode unlistenable. While Resident you just Evil, think. Resident Evil Helix. That is actually a bit better. <laughs> a, li- a little bit. I mean, it does kind of tie with like the yeah. the bio nonsense. Everything is just everything's just like oh we we fucked up in the lab, and and now everyone is a zombie. <laughs> I just went. Oopsie. We did an oopsie whoopsie I'm, in I'm, the lab. I'm gonna record this. Like we're gonna re- record this and upload this, and then. Two years from now, when they announce the title, <laughs> I'm gonna crop that bit and post it on Twitter. Yeah. Or if uh, be like, see, I was right, everyone. But if they do anxiety, you still have to do it to recognize my brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when when I said the game was larger in scope, I I don't mean necessarily just in like the place. Like, I mean in the the threats of um. Resident Evil 8 tackles way more types of horror 
and way more types of horror gameplay. So, like, there's a genuine moment in uh, the dollhouse moment, which, th- this isn't, like, this isn't an action horror game anymore. It's just Amnesia the Dark Descent for, like, 30 minutes. Yeah. And it has, like, it has vampires, it has werewolves, it has creepy dolls. It's way more thematically um, broad in the types of horrors it uses, uh, the types of genres it picks from, than uh, Resident Evil 7 was, which was more like on the bayou kind of documentary filmmaking horror. So I I haven't played 7. I've watched a playthrough of it, but that's also the case for 8 because mm-hmm. I, can pl- I can fucking play horror games. That's not a thing <laughs> I'm doing. Um I, I don't remember seven that much, but is it me or is eight way more action focused than seven? It it it's more um Yeah, it's more action focused. Um not that seven didn't have a lot of action, but I think m- there's yeah, more like set it, pieces to eight. I, I just remember like, seven being way more survival focused than this. Yeah, well, seven. It, yeah. S- it, rem- remember, when I think back to seven, I think more about like being in a cramped little house, uh, fighting weird swamp monsters in a basement. Whereas this, you're like running in between every house in the village, trying to ward off the werewolves. So um, yeah, you're fucking climbing the roofs of castles, yeah. shooting at flying things. Yeah. But like in it, in the playthrough me, that I watched, the dude never ran out of ammo. Uh, I don't know if he played on easy or something, but it was like ridiculous how much handgun ammo he had. And then also just he had so much money, he could upgrade every fucking gun to the maximum. And I remember this specifically being a case in Resident Evil 4 too, which is ironic Mm -hmm. because people are comparing this game to 4 because of the village setting and stuff. But in terms of gameplay, this feels like like a sequel to 4 as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually going to say like it to me Resident Evil 7 felt like what if we did Resident Evil 1 in first person? Well, 8 looks like let's do Resident Evil 4 in first person. Yeah, I think I think that's a very fair um analogy. Um I will yeah, say especially though, when you consider like the Hillbillies estate in Resident Evil 7, it's it's not quite as intricate as the Spencer mansion, but it it, it has shades yeah. of the spencer mansion in it where you have to get certain keys to unlock certain doors which open up shortcuts and you have to really learn the layout of the place in order to get around and then find secrets and stuff like that yeah i, w- I will say though that it's not as when you do it just in terms of like the action it's not as good as resident evil 4 um very few games are i think uh, the the game feel of four is just superb. The guns in an RE four feel fantastic even to this day. Yeah, even just reloading in that game feels amazing. When when I see fucking Leon jamming bullets in his hunting rifle, that shit pumps me up. <laughs> yeah, can I ask you guys? You guys, um, what do you think? Which do you like better, the first person RE's or the remake R like? Of the new RE's, which which do you like better, the third person or the first persons? I I haven't played through RE two or three remake yet, so I can't really comment on them. But I really enjoy RE seven. I thought mm. at first I was very skeptical about the first person perspective. I thought to me at first I felt like ah they're kind of just chasing trends, a la um, Amnesia and Soma and games of that ilk. But I ended up really enjoying the first person aspect. I thought it actually worked with Resident Evil in a weird way. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I made a video before Resident Evil Seven came out where I said as much, and I got a lot of comments from people saying like pretty much the same thing, where it's just like no, they're just dumbing down RE. My argument then, and I'm very happy that I was vindicated, is that like tank controls, first person can be used to facilitate uh, keeping information away from the player in a way that third person just can't. And that's gonna, that can be amplified, that can amplify the horror element of the game really well. Agreed. Um, You know what's, you can make a pretty good analogy, uh, not an analogy, but like, 
the jump from Resident Evil 7 to 8 is very similar to the jump from Resident Evil 2 Remake to 3 Remake, where it's, it's like 7 and 2 are very, um, to Remake, they're very much more horror driven. They're more about navigating this kind of scary environment and the resource management is like it's it drives the gameplay much more than the action whereas Resident Evil 3 remake and Resident Evil Village they they're they're made for people who have mastered the previous games 7 and 2 remake and you just like focus on the action at that point um so i i think Resident Evil 8 probably works better as an extension to 7 than as a standalone, if that makes sense. Um, I certainly think that's the case for Resident Evil 3 Remake. I think if you play that right after Resident Evil 2 Remake, it's way better. Okay, um, sounds fair. Yeah, um, but Bogan, you were talking about with Resident Evil 4... Uh, one thing I will say about Resident Evil 8, I don't think it has the replayability of 4. Would you I agree? Mean, you, you say that, and maybe you're right, but I've also seen people replay RE8 like three, four times already. Like, I've been seeing a lot of people replaying the game, like, obsessively. Mm. Um, I know I know that... Um, Maria Eurothug, she's beaten the game multiple times already. Yeah, I have a she, friend named She platinumed it in like a I week. Have a friend, yeah, my friend Ultimate Floyd um is speedrunning the game. He was able to beat the game under 3 hours. Hmm. Like you know, the, people are already replaying this game multiple times. So So I I'll just reiterate, it, it, I didn't play it. Okay. I, I watched the stream. Um, anybody who has played it and says it is more replayable than I think, uh, I will take their words for it. it just, I, yeah, to, I mean, I don't know for sure. I'm just saying, like, based on what I've seen, mm -hmm. like, it, it, it seems to be re a very replayable game. Maybe, arguably, not as much as RE4, but I think that's hard to say just because RE4 has been around for so mm -hmm. long that, like... People have found so many different ways to replay it. RE eight just came out, so yeah. Also, it's, it's hard to compare. Also, maybe it's an unfair comparison. Not many games are as replayable as RE four. So sure. maybe, yeah, maybe that's an unfair comparison of me in the first place. Also, replayability is kind of a very subjective thing. Yeah, but I find a. Uh, I find it's a very important thing in Resident Evil games. Um, oh, because they tend to be short. Yeah. Yeah, you guys, uh, I'm so happy that the internet responds to when the playtime length of RE8 came out. Like, the internet was pretty universally in agreement that this is a stupid argument. Stop having this argument. Stop starting this flame war. Length doesn't matter. I was so happy <laughs> that that was the response. For most people. Because I feel yeah. like every time a new RE game comes out, some idiot publication goes like, well, the game is only this long, and here's why that's a problem. So um, I was very happy to see that the internet was pretty unified in, uh, in what I would consider to be the correct stance to take on that issue. Do you know what made me happy about Resident Evil 8? Is... Mm -hmm that we have a protagonist who can keep his fucking mouth shut for more than five seconds. <laughs> there are actually long stretches in this game where Ethan doesn't say anything because he has no reason to say anything because he's just trying to survive in this foreign village. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, it makes sense for him not to say much. Yeah, he is, but it makes know. sense for a lot of AAA characters to not say much, but then they always what? do. And it fucking annoys me. And it's so, like, it was so refreshing to see these stretches of silence and gameplay. And they were so effective for the atmosphere, too. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is it's a horror game. So it's it's kind of hard to be scared if your character is constantly, like, making quips and being like... No, you, you don't need to explain. Yeah. I, Daniel, I'm saying this is a good thing. Remember, but, but also... remember the fucking 
segment in Last of Us 2 where Abby is, is going down in the hospital that is abandoned. That's also a horror segment. And Abby can't shut the fuck up. I remember uh, playing I don't know, in my mind... Descending a I'm mountain, not... and I, th I remember her being, like, pretty chatty with herself. Yeah, because like, they mean... keep saying dumb, inane shit all the time. Because I feel like a lot of developers have this, this mortifying fear now of leaving players to their thoughts or something. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I don't know. For for Last of Us, I, I get what you're saying where that section is more slanted towards horror. But in my mind, Last of Us does not exist in a horror space. Like, I do not consider that a horror game in, at all. Like, I don't I don't think anything about that game is remotely scary. I uh, I, I, I think, think that is a dedicated think, horror section, though. But even, I think, wait, wait, I even, think even outside point, the... I, I think Bogan's point is still uh, very valid in that... RE8 is still, you know, it is kind of a cinematic game in many ways, but it still, um, it still had the respect to just sh make Ethan shut the hell up when you're playing. Even outside the um, horror sure. idea, most of the time when main characters talk to themselves, it's really pointless. It's just to fill dead air. And it's yeah. like, I, I don't need this and I don't understand who needs this. Except people with with attention deficit disorder, <laughs> and we don't even like it either, Bogan. <laughs> I tell you, does it surprise you to know that I have attention <laughs> deficit disorder? <laughs> <laughs> like the simplest diagnosis ever. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I'm not like super bothered by the chatty protagonists in these. I like, I. It, to me, it just depends on the character themselves. Like, if are, do I like the character? Then I'm going to want them to be chatty because I want to learn more about them. Do I not like the character and do I find them annoying? Then yes, it's going to bother me because I don't want to hear them talk. Like, in Horizon Zero Dawn, I did not give a shit about Aloy. So her yeah, chatting all the time was annoying. She's because considered a character. positive example where, where it makes sense that she talks to her. But then whenever I play these games, they, it's not like they have anything to say it's always the stock dialogue of oh i need to do this or yeah. oh okay let's just get over this and then i'm almost there uh but, i have to get the milk from the fridge so i can make my coffee mm, i should i should i mean i should have a glass of water sure i can uh, i can agree that <laughs> like line, canned lines like that are kind of pointless and they don't need to be there but i'm not inherently against characters like being chatty and talking to themselves because if as long as what they're saying is interesting then i'm gonna want to hear what they have to say but you're right most of the time it's not anything interesting it's just them saying stupid shit like oh i'm falling down i better not fall or whatever some dumb line yeah, like that i'm not 100 against anything like that i'm just most of the time it's not the good implementation but it's always fucking there I th but I do think there we more often than not though games have the opposite issue where characters don't say anything in situations where they should say something. You're talking about Half Life Two. You could say Half Life, sure. Like uh, Gordon Freeman has nothing to say well, but about Gordon anything Freeman doesn't at all? say anything. Gordon Freeman Ever. is not a written character. Ethan Winters He's is not a character at all. He's literally not a character. Ethan he does talk. Say anything. Yeah. Can we? Uh, can we just in the middle of this conversation? Can Bogan? Can we appreciate how every attempt Ethan made at like a good one-liner when he killed an enemy, like when he killed a boss, every one-liner was terrible. They I were have all forgotten awful. all of them already. <laughs> yeah, they were so. There's nothing to them. It was just like, yeah, yeah, you, you die, bitch. It was just yeah. like, wow, <laughs> good job, Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> I, you die, bitch. <laughs> this, is, this is the other thing I wanted to talk about. Is I don't understand how self-aware Resident Evil is at this point. And it's kind of driving me nuts. That, oh, like Ethan in, by himself is such a dumb character. <laughs> just single-mindedly driven by one exact motivation that I don't really care about. <laughs> and then, like, he... The, the thing about this game is 
that Ethan is is molded. Uh, uh, okay, you, well, I was going to say maybe we shouldn't spoil this part for Daniel. Well, I already but... said we're going to spoil everything. I don't everything. care about the story of Resident Evil 8. Also, I, I read this in a plot synopsis of 7, so I don't know why it's a reveal in this game, especially after everything that happens during the game. You kind of can guess that shit anyway. Yeah. One, I think uh, I agree with you, Bogan, about like, I don't know the extent to which Capcom is devoted to a really solid direction for the series because they play that as like a really like powerful moment when they reveal that. But I was like, I don't, I don't care. Like I don't, I'm not playing Ethan's story for the powerful moment. Yeah, um, but but also like he gets his his. To also pierce through, he gets his hand cut off, Twice. and he still continues going on. Like, did I? Th was I supposed to think he's a normal human yeah. being? Yeah, but like you can then compare that to like remember in um, you didn't play RE2 remake, did you? You, you no, I did. Let's play. I played. This. Oh, you oh you did. Remember that scene where the man uh, with the daughter, where he goes into that uh, into the room. And you just hear like a gunshot. Like it's so weird to me that Resident Evil Two can have that scene, just like this harrowing scene of a man, assumably murdering his daughter or himself. Was that in because the intro? He was bit. I barely remember this. No, that's a uh, that's when Leon and Ada are together. Um, they make their way to like some storage house, and there's a okay. man who points a gun at them, and like his daughter walks up to them behind them and she's like she is slowly turning into a zombie and she can just like mutter daddy and mommy and ada is like well we have to terminate her and leon is like hey ada maybe maybe we can just leave them alone and they go into the room together and then you just hear a gunshot it's weird to me that resident evil can have a moment like that which you know that's a very just you, I would expect that scene in like uh, the Last of Us, but then yeah. they will also have uh, they will also have you die now, bitch, Ethan. They, after they, shooting like a crazy also, vampire monster, they will also have a giant. <laughs> you ob die now, bitch. <laughs> a giant obese <laughs> merchant who yeah. magically appears wherever you are to sell yeah. you shit. Did he get fatter? Throughout the game? Uh, uh, I didn't notice. Uh, but, that would be very interesting. But it's like... I don't know. So much of this game... Like, what, Ethan... What if... Wait, what if how fat he gets is proportioned to how much stuff you buy from him because then he can buy himself more food See, to I, make himself more fat. I you, think, actually, I think... <laughs> you actually get him to make food. I think that oh, really? actually, Daniel, I think that might be what happens. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah. I mean, that's just fucking weird. Yeah, because like, the that line would be the when, kind of dumb the, the line when add. the line when you make food is always like, "Oh, here's your share," or "Oh, please sit down, <laughs> let's eat." Yeah. Oh yeah. You can hunt animals in this one. You can like go yeah. fishing and stuff. Really annoyed me when the dude did that. <laughs> Like just leave the fucking pigs alone. You can you can do you have to, to kill the chicken? You you can kill anything else but the fucking harmless animals, maybe not. <laughs> you can't cook the zombies or the werewolves. Wait, why can't you cook them? <laughs> but it's you know, the the moment I I talked about in our Discord uh, towards the end where you meet Chris Mm -hmm. And the the whole dialogue scene is so fucking ridiculous. Where it's like, yeah. well, Ethan, you're not supposed to be here. I didn't want civilians to get involved. And meanwhile, you're fucking Ethan Winters, who has already taken down four different monsters who are as big as, like, houses. And then Ethan, in the next sentence, is like, okay, well, but... If you go out there, then take this, but try to stay under the radar. And then he hands you yeah. the keys to a tank. <laughs> and then you have a giant boss battle with a, with a metal monster. Say, uh, what is that? Bogan, can we agree, Bogan, that Chris was very poorly integrated into the plot? Yeah. 
Yeah, they're like, I I get that you want to have like, oh, why did Chris do what he did, and why? Oh, well, there's a mystery. It's a it's very poorly written. But you get nothing. I th- yeah, well, I think one of the problems with RE is because of its tonal just inconsistency. I think people give it a lot of slack for when it does stuff like that because you can always say, well, you're not supposed to take it seriously. But I I feel like I feel like Resident Evil 2 did this way better. Like there's there's I think there is something wrong with being so tonally just all over the place and I think like bad writing like what we saw with Chris's integration it it kind of it kind of sucks me out of the game a bit where it's like well okay Ethan I'll tell you why I didn't want to tell you this and it's like that took you two minutes. You couldn't have just told him that. But, but he and, didn't. Uh, I didn't want you to get involved. We can't yeah, have I didn't civilians, want civilians here. involved. We can't have civilians here who are running around with a rocket launcher. Yeah, and uh, it's like and a machine gun. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. At the end of the day, I just don't care about the story in any fucking Resident Evil game that I've played. I mean, I I beat RE4 just. A dumb action movie. RE5, not as good dumb action movie. RE6, terrible action movie Oh, plot. wait, Daniel, uh, you said Resident Evil 5. Bogan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like Chris's integration into the plot. I really like the Chris section. Because, like, he... It seems like his entire gameplay uh, act was just characterized by that one moment from RE5 when he punches the boulder. <laughs> It seems like they they played that scene and they were like, you know what? That's who he is now. But uh, Daniel, go on. But no, yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to get across that like I've I've beaten most RE games. Like I've beaten mm-hmm. a good chunk of the series, and not one of them has ever had like a story <laughs> in it that I cared like even a little bit about. Like, sure, I like some of the characters because I think some of the characters are kind of fun. But I aside like, from that, I like I like Leon. He's like Sonic the Hedgehog as an action hero. Where'd yeah. everybody go? Bingo. Bingo. No way, bro. <laughs> I knew you'd be fine if you your, landed on your butt. Your left hand your right comes hand? off. Yo, your right yeah. hand. <laughs> he's such a he's but, such a great character. See, I, I understand he's such a lovable goof. I understand not caring about the story of an RE game. It's just that this game is totally so fucking weird and inconsistent that it's comical. And if it's yeah. intended, this is fucking masterpiece comedy writing. If this is really <laughs> like, intended, like the, the way Ethan is written as this stoic, heroic, dumb guy who <laughs> fucking gets his hands chopped off and then he just reattaches his hand and he doesn't say anything he just looks at it and then continues on killing monsters but then at the same time every time he like go I mean, comes to towards fair, lady Dimit- dimitrescu or whatever where's my daughter i want to see my daughter this is so important to me <laughs> wait to be fair uh you could lose limbs in re7 as well and reattach them so this is like uh our ethan got some sort of regenerative abilities uh, when the hillbillies f- did something to him yeah. in RE7. So that's always been a thing. Yeah, but, but he always acts like like just a normal dude who has been thrown in this situation, as if he's not a fucking monster himself. He, he sure. doesn't acknowledge this, and ever. It's so weird. Yeah. I mean, that the problem is that Ethan is barely a character himself. You don't even see what his face looks like because they, for some reason, they decided oh, that yes they want... Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. They released a render. He looks yeah. like oh, a complete okay. nerd. <laughs> okay. Because in RE7, you never see what he looks like at no. all. You don't like, see his face. Uh, you don't see his face in RE8 either. Okay. You see it in, like, silhouette at best. Because, yeah, in RE7, um, there's a channel called Boundary Break where the guy went out of his way to, like, take the camera to show you and he literally has no face. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just nothing there. 
Yeah. I, I listened yeah, to the really to the weird. giant bombcast earlier, who also talked about this game, and they they one guy of them said, Ethan is the kind of character that when something weird happens in the game, he he like he both has too much and not enough of a reaction of a reaction to it at the same time. He's he's just. Yeah. I feel like that sums it up pretty well. It's completely impossible to get a handle on what this character is supposed to be and what mm. the writing in this game is supposed to be. But that's mm. it makes it fun. Yeah. I, I do think, though, that... Like, one of my favorite things about the old Resident Evils, and even this was even brought back into, like, the remakes, is I think there is real craft to a lot of the world building. I think being underground and reading about, like these scientific experiments, I think there's real, like, interesting world building that kind of gets thrown into the toilet the moment they go, like, and now here's the crazy alligator man, or, like, <laughs> a, an ex maybe an example that's actually in the game. Yeah, but it's also uh, you know, just yeah, big evil experiment is such a played-out cliche. Yeah. It's never fucking worth it. Just develop mm -hmm. a, a bomb. It's going to help you way more. Yeah. But yeah, overall, pretty good game, I feel like. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to play it when I have time. I'm very happy we have Let's Plays so that I can still experience these games somewhat. Well, I do. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing it. Uh, it looks like a lot of fun. Um, it is fun. I mean... Yeah, that I mean, R R E four in first person sounds like a good fucking time to me. Mm. I am totally down with that, one hundred percent. One thing, Daniel, uh, Boken and I agreed on this. I think uh, the dollhouse is the best part of the game. Okay, probably. This doesn't help cool. Daniel in any way. Like, not sure why you're telling him, but no, just like. Get ready. That's a that's my favorite part of the game. You better appreciate okay. it, Daniel. Yeah, you got Daniel. It? You nerd. You sure? Okay. Cool. Hey, anyway, you're kind of like you're kind of like Ethan. You also live like in the bayou. You're kind of a swamp man. <laughs> I, I do not actually. <laughs> Just because I live in Florida that doesn't mean I live in the swamp. No, Daniel. I'm, oh. not, I'm I'm not like I'm not like <laughs> coming out of bed. And you know, swimming with the fishes and uh -huh. like, hey, what's up, guys? Dan I, Daniel, I algae. Is, Daniel is the guy who merges with a giant fish. Oh, that's oh. right, that's right. I'm kind of like of Leon, course. I think. Of course, I'm I'm lovable, but I'm often uh, I'm often uninformed on things, so I'm like Leon. Boken, you can be Albert Wesker. I'm probably Heisenberg. You're, you're, you're dubious. <laughs> Interesting. No, no. I Wesker has too much of an of an agency. Heisenberg <laughs> is the guy who who has just been thrown into the shit, and now he's like fed up. Yeah. Anyway, this was your your dedicated topic, your dedicated discussion of yeah. RE eight by three people who haven't actually never played, played it. it. Who have never played it. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. This is the kind of content that our our listeners are just craving for. Yeah. We do this for you guys. Uh, anyway, Bogan, what else have you been playing? One of okay. those video games where the anime girl runs out early in the morning with a piece of bread in her mouth? No, I have not mm. played that. I'm sorry, I got you confused for Daniel. What have no! you been playing? Oh, wow. Got him. <laughs> What a sick burn. How am I going to recover from that? You know what, Daniel? That sick burn was brought to you by me, the man who wrote all the one-liners from Resident Evil 8. <laughs> They're so bad. I thought you were going to say, but I was brought to you by Skillshare. Oh. <laughs> Design your own way. I was like, I was like <laughs> oh, do we have, a, we have sponsors now? <laughs> it was brought to you by Squarespace. Design your sick burn website today. I'd, Bro uh, brought I would, to you by I, Audible. I they want to let you you know that Daniel, you're supposed to not only <laughs> listen to autobiographies. Brought to you by Audible, where you can read your favorite books with your ears. I do what I want. What have you been doing, Boken? 
Uh, so I've played a little game called Kaze and the Wild Masks, which is a Donkey Kong 2 ripoff. Oh. Donkey Kong Country 2 ripoff. Uh, like, it's actually really weirdly a hom- homage to DKC2 to the point where this is this is not a monkey. This is a, a rabbit girl. And instead of using her hair like Dixie does, she uses her uh, ears to pick up shit and to climb shit and all that stuff. And the mm. animations basically look the same. Like, actually look the same. The throwing animation okay. of barrels is the same. Does it um, also have that horrible CRT uh, jagged models, which look good in CRT No, no, TVs, it, looks, but... it looks like all right pixel art. Okay, and I'm, okay. I'm also, I'm not trying to be down on the game. It's actually a decent game. It's just way too short. But it's just weird how these animations are the same. The, the jumping is very similar. Um, she also can, like, do a little propeller thing to fly farther. And then you have the wild masks where you turn into a different animal form, sort of. And one is you turn into an eagle, you sprout wings, and then you can shoot projectiles, which is exactly like the fucking uh, uh, parrot in DKC2. Like, exactly the same thing. And then you have one that is a fish that can thrust forward underwater. Like, the fuck? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a love letter. It just felt really weird. A little, too, a little too loving. Yeah, maybe. So that that distinctly reminds me of. I'm sure no one here listens to the band Weezer. No, no. I think there's a moratorium on talking about music on the podcast. Actually, yeah, fuck you. Also, um, I, I think you listen more to Weeber. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh, oh damn! The burns burn just shit. keep coming. I just. I need some ointment for Save all Save yourself, burns. Daniel. Oh, no. Uh, so the reason I bring them up is because they recently came out with a new album called Van Weezer, which is supposed to be this like tribute to Van Halen. But for whatever bizarro fucking reason, one of the songs, which is the worst song on the album by far, mm-hmm. is called Blue Dream. And Blue Dream is just straight up crazy train by ozzy osbourne they wholesale rip off the intro and central riff to that song and just make a way worse version of crazy train Hmm. so that's what this sounds like to me where they're just like taking this other thing just just doing a weird sample it's I, i can't even tell if it's a sample or not it sounds like it could be. But they're not, I don't know. They're not upfront it's, about it? I don't... I think it's pretty obvious that it's Crazy Train. Like, it's... it's they, It is super obvious that it's Crazy Train. But mm. the, the, the point is, they're just, like, taking this thing wholesale and then changing the lyrics, and it's not entirely the same song. And, yeah, this is what this game sounds like to me. It's just Blue Dream. Okay. We're going off the rails... In this blue oh. dream. Doesn't the song go like that? No. Does uh, the... th- thankfully, it's not quite that bad. But <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's not a good song. It's it's one of the worst Weezer songs I've ever heard. It's like, yes. why would you do this? Are your na- is your name Daniel or Danimale? Like Daniel and anime mixed together. Got him. I got see, him, Bogan. See, that doesn't work. That doesn't I got work. him, Bogan. Didn't I get him, Bogan? That doesn't work. That's Bogan, did I get him? Shame on you. The B- Bogan, please, did I get him? Bogan, so please. I, I also <laughs> watched uh, the Demon Slayer movie. The new you one. You watched the what movie? The Demon the Slayer movie. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. How was that? Um, it was a three out of five until the last half hour and then it became a four out of five wow okay. pretty my... strong finish then yeah it was a subpar demon slayer story and then there was a huge confrontation at the end and then really like heartwarming and sad things started happening 
and they were pretty great, which I don't even want to spoil. Um, I, although I, I'm going to say, I feel like this is a pretty standalone story by itself where you don't even need to have watched the first season of the anime to enjoy this too. Um, just first season, isn't it? Isn't there just one season? Didn't it end? No, it didn't end. Oh. We had a first season, and then this is, I think, by itself also an arc in the anime, and in the manga, which has now been turned into a movie. Did the manga end? I think it's still ongoing. Oh, I try to keep away from manga nerds. Yeah, they're they're awful. Yeah, and it, it really annoys me that they're always like way further into the story than I am because I only watch the anime. <laughs> then whenever I mention something, it's like, well, actually, in the manga, uh, you will see this and this happening. And I'm like, fuck off. I don't want to know. <laughs> no, thank you. No, some things so I, were not meant for men to know. So I've been like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd go as far as say hesitant, but I've been kind of like, eh, somewhat interested in Demon Slayer. Seems like an all right show. The, honestly, the biggest thing about it that makes me want to check it out is Ufotable animated it, and they're the same studio that did Kar no Kyokai, which, What's hey that? guys, if you, if, you haven't, if you haven't seen that episode of the podcast, you might want to give that a shot. Which episode is um, that? Kar no Kyokai. Yeah. The Garden of Sinners, where we do a, a full spoiler cast discussion on it. What? Was I in that episode? The animation Anyways. is really beautiful. <laughs> I'm being funny. I remember. Yes. No, I know you remember. Uh, no, yeah, that's... And that's because Ufotable is like really are really talented animators and that's that's like one of the reasons that why i kind of want to check it out so like, well i really like you photobo's art and animation so that kind of makes me want to see it wait but... a minute didn't those guys also make the 2016 adaptation of berserk no they did not <laughs> who did that did they don't... did they commit no. suicide did they commit like sudoku after that <laughs> 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 no, not Sudoku. <laughs> Who did do that one? Hold uh, on. Sapoku, yeah. I don't remember. Okay, it was Studio Gemba, which I had <laughs> never heard of before. Look, those people, uh, they had to pay the rent. I, I don't begrudge them for doing that. They've literally <laughs> done only two, three anime. Okay. Berserk. Yeah, that was great. And yeah. and the magnificent Kotobuki. Excuse what the me? fuck is that? <laughs> I I don't know what this uh, is. Anyways. Is that the show Which where they're the, mit, where yeah. they're magicians but also robbing banks? I Is that the I show uh is that the show where they have the girl who's like a really bad performance magician and she has really big boobs i don't know she has like gray hair mm, i don't know i've never heard of this before bogan what's that show i have no idea no i don't know anyway Anyways. uh the the funny thing is that demon slayer by itself is wonderfully animated like it has always had these these great sword fights and the swords always have these mm -hmm. these wonderful like colored uh, arcs when they're swung and it all looks beautiful the animation just that the movements goes, all looks great swish, swish. Yeah. and then at the same time this movie has some of the worst cgi effects that i've ever seen in an anime Ooh. it looks uh. terrible it looks fucking worse than, awful. <laughs> worse than Berserk 2016? Uh, probably. Because I oh remember... Oh my no. god, no. I don't believe Dude, that. Dude, it looks like it's from the that. fucking 90s, straight up. Yeah, so did Berserk. <laughs> so did Berserk. Does it? I've there seen were Berserk. There were but, literal sections in Berserk where Guts would be walking... And it was obvious that they were just like, like moving yeah, this I character model around. 
but in like this, you do in, movie in, in this maker. movie in this movie without wanting to spoil too much yeah. it's it's a bunch of fle- it's a fleshy substance that keeps spreading further and further and this the texture looks it looks like a 90s oh, no. screensaver oh, it is no. so awful <laughs> And it's so that jarring compared to the beautiful animation of the sword, f- sword fights and shit. <laughs> Just, Jesus. I don't know. Yeah. I understand that you want to save money by using uh, 3D animation for something that is very complex to draw by hand. But that was not the place to start saving money. No. Maybe they should have uh, tried harder to make it good. They should have tried harder. Just put in a bit more effort. It's it's no, shut up. <laughs> I mean, how hard can it be to draw? Really, I can yeah. draw. I mean, they have so many people working there, right? Like fucking. Yeah, well, the, one of can't... you pick up a coffee and get to work. One of those, one of those lazy you... animators can't just get off his ass and do some job. Yeah. Animators are very lazy, and I, d- I think I think they are woefully overpaid for the jobs they they do too. <laughs> I mean, if this is the end result, I'm not sure yeah, how much I money mean, they should make. Look, I I wasn't gonna be the one to say this, but I think we should just stop watching anime. <laughs> uh, anyways. It. Uh, I've, so I've also watched Inception for the first time. For the first time? Yes, I've never seen it before. Oh. I've never seen it either. Oh my god! Oh my god! Christopher what, what are you Nolan. all my guying me for? You, this is your first time watching it. <laughs> At least he has watched it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I understand. So? Boken has a job. I understand why Boken wouldn't have watched it. You're just watching anime and. Reading eroge visual novels. <laughs> what? The last show I watched, aside from Avatar, was The Sopranos. What the fuck are you talking about? Uh, what is The Sopranos if not American anime, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> the the reason why I haven't watched it in no small part is also because I'm a d- very uh, contrarian are you a Nolan hipster. Hater? I'm a contrarian hipster uh, who, when everyone fucking loses their mind over how great a movie is, I'm going to go, no. <laughs> okay, you say that, but here you are watching Demon Slayer, literally the most popular anime of all time right now. Yeah, but anime Wait, really? is... There, well, that's, that's, like that's probably not true, but also anime is a subsection of... Like, I can talk, I can go no, to any no, normie that's... and to talk to them about Demon Slayer. Okay, but the Demon Slayer movie is literally the best, the the highest grossing animated film of all time right now. No. That's not true. Yes. And Frozen yes. made billions of dollars. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, highest oh. grossing RR rated. Oh. Oh. At hmm. g- the highest grossing animated R rated film. Yeah, because all the like highest grossing an animated movie are from Pixar or fucking Disney. Right, no, those those definitely have made more money. Yeah, but like, still, still though. What did you think? Of... This is still really popular. What did you think of Inception? It was annoying. Oh, uh, <laughs> what did you love it? No, I just I just like it. I don't think it's annoying. Really? Like I. I had trouble really immersing myself because I just my mind keep kept on rattling because the story moves on so so quickly and they keep throwing new rules at you and I'm like am I dumb for not understanding this or are they bullshitting me right now like I are they is, is the story writer trying to get one over on me is that what's happening here to keep the, saying, the conflict going are you calling Christopher Nolan a hack I think Christopher, Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan has written Interstellar. Has he written it? I don't know. He has directed uh, it. I think so. I think he directed it. I don't know if he wrote it. I think he co-wrote it with somebody. And I think that ending is fucking bullshit. I think that ending never, is from the original. Uh, isn't that from the, uh, isn't it called Contact, the book it's based on? I don't care. Contact? 
Uh, yeah, it's the one. So, uh, so some science guy from like the seventies or whatever wrote a wrote a book called Contact, and they adapted that into like with uh, into Contact. I think Jodie Foster's in it, and they did a b- bad job. And then Christopher Nolan was like, "I'm Christopher Nolan. I made Memento. I'm uh, also m- more popular movies. I'm gonna make this better." Oh, he made. And them. he did. Okay, actually, Memento is great. Memento is great. I think I'm... Christopher Nolan, I love his movies, and I think he's a good movie maker. And I don't think, like, I. this is what I don't like, is when, like, it's, it's this either or. Like, either he's the greatest of all time or, like, the worst director of all time. He's, no, he, he can just be a good director who sometimes makes good movies and sometimes he misfires. I, I don't, I, I like don't even when... think Inception is a bad movie. No. I don't think Interstellar is a bad movie, but I did not enjoy it because... No, I, it I was... think neither is a masterpiece. I think they're both just like Yeah, pretty both solid. at least have, are very flawed. Yeah. I, I, no, but I think what Acer is trying to say is like people tend to go all or nothing. Either yeah, sure. a director is like the greatest of all time or they're like the hackiest hack that's ever hacked. And yeah. it's like, why? why can't it just be that like... Sometimes they make good stuff. Sometimes they make that de- bad stuff, and like that's just how it is. Like you can't just expect someone to just always come out with bangers or always come out with garbage. Well, like, not, you, not you a- always have fanboys who are just really praising those yeah. movies uh, into the high heavens, and then you have contrary fanboys who just want to say no, everything he's done is shit. Yeah, and they're, I, they're um, just pushing each other. I I think his. Batman movies were really good. I really liked those. I think um, Tenet was really good. Uh, people didn't... People f- people were sour on Tenet. I think that one may come back. I really enjoyed it. And I think uh, Dunkirk was also really good. And Memento. I really like The Prestige. Like, it, it, good lord. Like, he doesn't need to be Kubrick. He's, he's, he's out there doing, like, people-pleaser blockbuster movies that are, you know, it's... Y- it's not Michael feel, Bay. A, it's it's. The, the, he feels more like a Spielberg to me than a Kubrick. No, that's what I'm saying. He doesn't need to be Kubrick. He's just like he's making, you know, movies that a lot of people want to see, and he at least has some interest in being like you know this is my authorial stamp. This is my creative vision, and it's not always great, but it's not. Let's hire this indie director and have him just direct a movie at gunpoint. That's div- it's not freaking um it's not captain it's not just sam i was gonna say captain marvel because that's his uh comic book name originally it's not just sam it's not it's not he uh whatever he he i think he makes good movies i've brought a lot of my chris nolan baggage into this talk <laughs> <laughs> clearly what did you think of uh inception it's annoying you think it it just moved too fast and it it made me not enjoy it as much because uh, when when you have a movie like I'm I don't want to think about the rules all all the time, but the characters talk about the rules all the time, and it keeps making less and less sense. Like at some point, you just lose the plot, and then you're not even sure if there was a plot to begin with. Hmm. And then it's uh, you. At least I became so detached from the action because I was like, well. I don't know what layer they're on anymore or why they can't do this on that layer to do this on that other layer. It's just, they, they, they had a plan. The movie is, is very small in scope, I feel like, in so far yeah. as it is always defined what the ultimate goal is. But I, I understand you have a movie where to reach that goal, you have a plan and then something goes wrong and you need to alternate on the plan to keep going but that alternation happened every fucking 15 minutes and it kept getting worse and worse for no good reason i feel like like the situation already was bad it was already tense and then like oh now this is happening oh no so now we have to do this instead of that and we and then we have to do blah blah and blah and it's just like calm fucking down like stop writing yourself into a corner just just follow the plan. It's okay. Yeah. And yeah, it, it felt overwritten. 
I guess. I don't think uh, I don't think you'd like Tenet very much. I I do want to watch it though. I'm not sure. Mm. I, I feel like I watched Inception in preparation for Tenet, even though that makes no sense. <laughs> but I'm no like not a lot of Christopher Nolan's movies. Like I think there's there's more like accessible stuff like Batman. But then there are puzzle box movies he makes, like Memento, like Inception, like Tenet, which are like, you're going to watch this and you have to like piece together exactly what this movie is. Because it's so like, it's like watching a stopwatch being made more than more so than listening to a story being told, if that makes sense. Yeah, but see, I don't, I, I'm always not sure how much credit I want to give him. That's the problem. It's oh. like an it's an assault on my intelligence, because I always question like, am I too dumb to understand this movie? <laughs> and the answer is probably no, but I still can't really follow it. I can follow the uh, whatever. I'm done. <laughs> See that this is what I what I will say though, just briefly. I think there is craft to it. Um, like Memento. I don't like that does not feel like an insult on my intelligence because when I was done with Memento, I did not need to like sit down and think like, OK, what exactly? How does this movie piece together? Uh, yeah. I had to do that for Inception. I had to do that for Tenet. Memento, I think, is much better constructed in that way. Absolutely. Like Memento has that moment where the color bleeds into the black and gray and then you're like, ah, OK, so this yeah. was the structure. Absolutely. Like, Memento felt... It also didn't feel so breathless. Yeah, well, also, Memento didn't deal with as, like... It, was, it wasn't It was as detached from reality, so you didn't have to think about as many just bizarre rules. Yeah. 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 Um, see, but at the, ultimately, at, at, after the movie, what I came away with was at least fucking... Christopher Nolan makes original movies. He doesn't make fucking whatever. The he doesn't make three, three Batman movies. He doesn't make only franchise movies. He he That's actually true. has ideas and puts them into movies that are popular. And and when mm. he made a franchise movie, he put so much of himself into it. Yeah. The Dark Knight, yeah. wonderful movie. Very mm. very good. I, uh, so, yeah. I think Batman Begins is a stronger movie. I've had to debate this very often, but we shan't will, do that I here. I will not debate this with you. I also <laughs> haven't watched Batman Begins in a long, long time. Oh. You can just take my word for it, though, right? Sure. Yes! I got him. No, fuck you. Yeah. Oh, I, I liked The Dark Knight too much. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, and then um, lastly... Do you guys know what yeah. Super Mario Brother Brothers Z is? I know what No. I know what Super Mario Brothers is. And you know what the Z is likely from? Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball. Z. That is correct. Okay. So this is uh Jesus Christ. I have a very long and storied history with Super Mario Brothers Z. Um, okay. It started out as a animated series, Flash series, I want to say, on Newgrounds. Back I, when I, I was going to say, was it Newgrounds? Back when I was in high school, probably, maybe even earlier. I'm not sure. We're going back. We're going fucking back, man. This, <laughs> this is Mario characters and Sonic characters. Having Dragon Ball Z battles to fight for the for the emerald, for the Chaos Emeralds, wow. in okay. wow. in the Mushroom Kingdom. That's like the, very uh, the Chaos that's very new grounds flash the Chaos animation. Emeralds. The Chaos Emeralds have landed in the Mushroom Kingdom, and now Sonic and Shadow meet up with Mario and Luigi. To find the Chaos Emeralds, while also Mecha Sonic and Bowser mm. and Wario and Waluigi are also looking for them. Can I ask you a question, Bogan and Daniel too? Why can't Sonic's adventures just be like 
hey, Sonic, somebody's polluting the lake. Could we have to go stop it? Why is it these... <laughs> Why does it have to be like this conceptually ridiculous <laughs> stuff? I, Dude, I don't know. I don't fucking play Sonic. Also, this is Do a, I look like someone that plays Sonic? Also, this isn't a Sonic project. This is a fan project. Yeah, I, I this know. This is not but officially it's like, written. I, it's just like, why Chaos Emeralds? Why, is it so <laughs> why aren't Sonic's games just about like, hey, Sonic, this evil company is polluting the lake and we have to stop them. Okay, Tails. Come on, let's. We gotta go fast. Why does it always devolve into all these like, these? Ah, oh, ah! Oh. Sonic makes me so mad. Barack Obama chuckled. Oh, you mean the Chaos Emeralds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, the the point of this fucking project uh, is that uh, this has some of the greatest fight scenes I have ever seen. It is fucking incredible. Like the guy who does this, I think he's he has different names. He, he I think he's called Mark Heinz. He al mm. also goes by uh, Elvin Earthworm. I want to say um, he. It looks like he's an incredible not only animator. Like he uses um, the sprites. I want to say from the Mario RPGs from the 3DS or NDS. Mm -hmm. uh, probably those from like Inside Bowser story or whatever it's called. Um, and then I don't know what the whatever Sonic games came out on the it's 2D Sonic sprites. I don't know. I don't play Sonic games, but he uses those sprites and he fucking is so good at creating Dragon Ball Z battles with these <laughs> sprites. Like they're fighting a bunch of Koopa Troopers and they're fighting these weird rangers. I don't even know what game they were from. But like the the choreographies in terms of how the battles are escalating and then the effects from various Dragon Ball Z games. And then you have these like these these after images when something goes really fast. And then just just the, the spectacle of Mecha Sonic beating a Yoshi into a pulp. And throw like punching Yoshi through through mountains, done in these fucking outdated um, Mario just graphics, two D Mario graphics. It is wild. Like it is so. It is so well done for a fucking fan project. So I've always loved the the Super Mario Brothers Z episodes that came out. And this was probably 15 years ago when this started. And um, eventually... Is it still going on? It's, well, that's that's the, the part where, where I have this, this sordid history with a franchise. With a franchise. Oh. Um, because eventually Mark Haynes stopped making these. Um, and then he started a reboot series. Like he remade... He started remaking this series. And I was like, you stopped in the middle of fucking of the story. Like the the, the last episode is nothing you can end on at all. <laughs> it basically just got started. But of course, these these things take him a long, long time to make. And so I was really annoyed by the fact that he's now rebooting the series. And but at the same time, then I think a year ago the reboot came out, and it was good. Like it's it's basically the same story, but now with better quality. Still, the fights are still great. He still got it basically. But then, just basically when when the story ended, I started following the guy on Twitter, and I became so annoyed by the person himself because. <laughs> He was just wallowing like in self pity, and I don't. I mean, I don't want to make fun of depression, but it's like he was just complaining every day about, uh, oh, I didn't get anything done, and now Nintendo is trying to copyright strike my videos, and blah, and just, just complaining all the time. And then you know, the the last episode of the original series came out eight years ago or something, and you're just sitting there waiting for something new. And the guy yeah. is just manip sabotaging himself. Yeah, you know who didn't do that was Little Karibo. Like, ha that guy 
fought tooth and nail against Konami's army of lawyers, <laughs> and he won. Like no, he fought a uh, four kids army of lawyers. He won. Four kids imploded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Little Karibo fucking defeated four kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucking incredible. Yeah. And that's like one of that's like that meme like who would win uh, a, a a fucking huge organization or one meme boy. Yeah. Meme boy. <laughs> or uh. one little Karibo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um so I just I I kind of gave up on the series. And now he keeps making episodes and it, it took him a year from the last well, a year and two months, I think, from the last episode. But now he's actually remade the second episode. Like, okay. there's a new episode out now. When I was like, okay, the first episode was good, but this guy, I know he's not going to do anything else. He's not productive. Like, he's he's just going to wallow in self-pity again, and I'm going to be let down. A real Vulcan of a man. Well, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. That was kind of yeah. <laughs> what? For no reason. It <laughs> was really fucked up. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'm being. But, st- uh, the, he proved you wrong. The point being, I'm being strung along now. <laughs> and and at any point, he might go into the "oh, everything sucks." I'm gonna stop making the series now, <laughs> mood. And then I I'm gonna he sit here with blue this. balls because I want to see the next Super Mario Bros. Z remake episode. It's fucking. What the hell? What's his Twitter handle? Um, I'm not sure. I want everybody listening to this to go on Twitter and to just asperage this guy with No. You better not you better Stop not this. give up That's again. That's not you even coward. funny. That's not funny. <laughs> you don't do that. Nah, guys, leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, that that was a joke. And I I, I I have nothing Please. personal against the guy. It's just I I was just the the, the outside observer who just wanted more cool shit and then I was drawn into these personal... Man, fucking... You guys go watch that second episode of the remake and tell me that the Mecha Sonic versus Yoshi fight isn't the hypest shit you've ever seen. (sighs) Yoshi fucking swallows the Chaos Emerald and powers up (sighs) and then he beats the shit out out of Mecha Sonic for a while... It's so like May- the 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 fights <laughs> that this guy can create with these basic sprites are unrivaled. Actual actual fucking mastercraft animator this guy. And it's all in service of a story where Mario and Sonic team up to fight Bowser and Dr. Robotnik. I just refuse to engage with the Sonic fandom at this point. I just this- it's just Sonic lends himself to so much he's just so like I said because it's because it's so overly complicated it's just it always comes across as so cringy to me with like the chaos emeralds and all that stuff uh, that's also part of the Mario. charm is is the writing in this it's just uh, like it's 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 just not well written but it's also not self it doesn't feel very self-aware and there are like slight jokes but they're not jokey enough to fall flat but at the same time it's also not funny it's just (laughs) so weird man Mm. god this is a weird series yeah it's just crazy that i'm here to experience this (laughs) yeah and maybe somewhere out there in our audience there's someone who feels the same who, who actually cares about this dumbass shit. Let me know in the <laughs> comments. I'm done now. All right, okay. cool. So we're going to reconvene soon after the break. Um, so look forward to when we discuss whether or not authorial intent matters. See you in a little bit. everyone welcome back <coughs> so the discussion topic this time around is 
is I'm not, do uh, I'm not doing uh, this on purpose. <laughs> no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think you were. I was plucking my nose hair, and it's uh, I have like an irritant in my throat now. It's all like you a. You know, I didn't need to know that. <sighs> okay, rule from I now on: to, dude, leave your nose hair alone while dude, you're doing a podcast recording. When you were doing that, I was literally <laughs> thinking to myself, I'll just edit that part out. I'm not going to acknowledge it. The but listeners. Then you had to acknowledge it, and now I have to leave it in. The listeners need to know. Does authorial intent matter? Uh, I mean, this is also connected to death of the author, you know. That kind of thing. Yes, it's another discussion about death of the author, folks. Uh. So, I, I, this is something I've been thinking about recently, and I'm of the opinion that authorial intent largely doesn't matter. I don't. I'm not. I don't subscribe to the extreme of. The author work. doesn't matter at all. Yeah. But I would say, like, the author doesn't pr doesn't matter for, you know, 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. I would say... So how do you guys generally feel? For me, um, just, like, the way I make videos, I think... Uh, and maybe... The, I, mean, I evaluate games very much just on the basis of, like, how I make videos about them, where the first thing I want to know is... What exactly was the developer going for? And then I look at the game and I go, well, how did they try to implement that? So to me, uh, the intent is very important for me to be able to understand the work. Uh, as for appreciating the work, largely I don't care what the developer was going for. It's when I appreciate something, it's more about how I felt when I want to understand it. I, I need to understand what they were going for. Okay. And Bogan, what's your general take then? I would need to know what does it matter mean? Like mat matter to what, for whom, to do Does what? it matter? <laughs> does it matter to the people who are working on the game? <laughs> <laughs> um okay i uh, my Matter my point is i'm i think i'm also somewhere in the middle where it if i appreciate something i don't really need to know what the intent was because i can find my own appreciation but the, at the same time i feel like it can make for an interesting topic or for an interesting video to explain to a different audience maybe something they missed because you might have picked up or read about the intent of the author and just so what i mean what do i mean is does authorial intent matter basically does what the does the intentions of the author while they were creating the work matter to what in, in regards to like evaluating something uh, towards evaluating it, to me, yes, uh, the intent of the author is very... I, I take great stock in what they were going for because I feel like if I don't know what they were going for, it's very hard for me to, in good conscience, make any evaluation because otherwise it's just like... It's so subjective at, at that point. It's just, well, here's what I like, here's what this mechanic that did for me... Whereas when I have the in, the uh, the intention of the uh, of the creator, I can go. This this uh, implementation of this mechanic connects to this system, which is a way the director was trying to you know have the game play to this emotion or what have you. Um, okay, so let me let me ask a question then. So what if? This is this is a very hyperbolic example that makes no sense, but mm -hmm. it's just just to get uh, just to get everyone's take. What if tomorrow we found out that when Shigeru Miyamoto made um, Mario Odyssey or whatever, um, actually I don't even know if he had anything to do with Odyssey, but okay, whatever. What if tomorrow we found out that the intentions of the team when making Mario Odyssey was to make a first-person shooter? Yeah, then I would say they f like 
that would be they interesting. Failed utterly. To, yeah, they failed utterly. But, but, that, but there's a, does that matter? Well, see, it, it matters in so if I'm analyzing it from the perspective of what were they going for, like how how exactly does this game work? I would like to root it in what were you going for because then I can say this is a good attempt, this is a bad attempt, but I'm also not super married to it. I can say like there's a lot of games I like that try to do things that they didn't that didn't necessarily work and that accidentally did things that did work that the directors mm-hmm. didn't intend on like um like Shadow of the Colossus, Ueda had no expectations that you would give a, you would give two shits about aggro. Like that was not the point, but people loved it, so he was like, "Oh, okay. Uh, I guess I'll make the last guardian then. Uh, that's just gonna be the point." Um, see, yeah, to me, I don't care at all that um, ag- you. The point wasn't that you were supposed to get invested. And I, I literally do not give less a, a shit that Fumito Ueda. Um, that was unintentional on his part because. Like because it's the the game still lended itself in a way to or like the way that the game is made that you as a player naturally grow attached to Agro because he's your companion throughout the entire she. game. He, I'm I'm sorry, yeah, she she's your companion throughout the entire game. You can um, you corrected she, me on this uh, a few episodes ago. Yeah, my my bad. Um, yeah, she she helps you throughout the entire game. Like she. She is beneficial to you in a gameplay sense. She's, um, she helps you get around. Certain Colossus literally can't be beaten without her. Like she is a vital part of the game experience, and that makes the the moment at at the end um, hit that much harder. So I don't care that that was unintentional. I don't think that matters. I think there's a difference between. That though, and if Mario was supposed to be a first-person shooter, because that's an that was an mm-hmm. example of they accidentally landed on something. Whereas if Mario was a first-person sh- Mario a first-person shooter, that would just be an example of well, you fundamentally failed to make what you were trying to make. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. But I, I think, to a so ridiculous I think it's a degree. bit different. Sure. Yeah. So I was trying to give. I, the the main point, yeah, it's a super ridiculous example, but the main point of the example is that it at that point it doesn't really matter if they were going for a first person shooter. They still made Mario, which is great. Oh, oh no, no, I I, I meant to say that I, what I mean is it doesn't matter to me what the director wasn't trying to do. Like it doesn't matter to me that Ueda wasn't trying to make. Acro uh, such a seminal part of the game, but it does matter to me what Ueda was trying to do. Okay, like, it, I think it, that's an interesting distinction. Yeah, the, it it would not matter to me that you know Super Mario was not supposed to be a porn game like that. If that if it wasn't supposed to be a porn game, then I don't really care to uh to know that. I don't care. Like I don't need that to uh be able to fully appreciate the game from like an analytical perspective but i would need to know it would be very in- important for me to understand like yeah we wanted to make a first person shooter well okay then i'm going to look at the game as a first person shooter and i'm going to have to seriously evaluate it from that angle okay so i also wanted to ask so what do you guys think when creators put something in their work that they themselves are not fully aware of what it means to them at the time. So, like, let's say they, uh, a director puts a scene in a movie just because he felt like, I need to put the scene in the movie. He doesn't, he can't articulate why. He doesn't, he, he or she themselves don't fully understand why they need to put that scene in the movie. It's a, it's a compulsion. Does that mean that the scene has no meaning? Mm. I wouldn't say no meaning. It probably has. Um, probably, I'd allow myself more room for speculation or I mean, like or like. Clearly, I, it has a scene... meaning because the scene is still there, and you're affected yeah. by that scene being there. Yeah, but the point I'm trying to make is, I think some people 
would argue, well, if the if the creator isn't sure why they put that scene there, then that inherently means the scene has no meaning. I would not go that far with it. Um, if the creator felt it was necessary, like, why did they feel it was necessary? Was it like, did they feel it balanced the movie better to have that scene? Was it, oh, I feel like this is necessary because it brings the pacing down, because it's just a little moment where you have these characters interact, which then you know, pace off later when these characters interact again. Like so, I, it, it doesn't sound so, like yeah, in, yeah. in your example, or I mean, you didn't provide an, you didn't provide an example, but you make it sound like it's not like there's no thought going into it. The director or whatever can't, re can't just really explain why that has to be there. They can't, it's, they're unable to articulate it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give an actual example then. So in the first episode of The Sopranos, at the uh, end of the episode... How did I know? How did I know? <laughs> You're going to smuggle The Sopranos back in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sopranos is one of the best TV shows ever made. I can't help it. I got to bring uh, it up. Uh, it's okay. It's aight. It's aight. Whatever. Anyways, <laughs> at the end of the first... At the, uh, so just to be clear psychology is like a big part of the Sopranos. Like the main character sees a therapist nearly every episode. So just keep that in your back pocket. In the first episode, at the end of the first episode, there is a, uh, a flock of birds that Tony sees at the very end of the episode. Um, David Chase said at the moment, he didn't really understand why he felt the need to put that scene who, in the first who is episode. Tony Chase? Is he like the writer? No, or is there... uh, uh, David what? Chase. Yeah, who, Tony, who, who Tony, is he? Tony is the main character. David Chase is the showrunner. He okay. uh, he created the show. He's written most of the episodes. He's or like at the... a Kevin Feige. He's like overseeing the thing. Or yes, yes. Yeah, okay. He's he's directed episodes. Um, he's written episodes. Every single script goes through him first like he like he has final say on everything it's his show okay so um at the end of the episode we have the the birds and he said in that moment he didn't really understand why he felt the need to put that there but then um when the therapist because the the therapist um talks to tony about that specific scene and um, David said uh, that in that moment, he had to actually think about, okay, why did I put that there? And um, he, he consulted um, uh, like psychology books. He started re reading up on psychology books and he started realizing that, oh, this is, a, this is representative of family. This is Tony, the character that he, you know, the main character. Um, this is, this has to do with Tony's feelings towards his family, his familial bond, and how he feels like it's um, it's escaping him, and that like his family is uh, like g getting a getting away from him as he's so like narrow mindedly focused on his you know his mafia goings on as as a, I guess I should say. Wait, he's a mafioso? <gasps> I thought he was in trash. Or sanitation. Wait, but are you saying Trash that he, he put those birds in there before searching like his own intuition further? Yes. To understand yes. why so, he did it. Yes. So he put the birds first. He didn't understand why. And then later he had to like analyze himself and Was think that about in a okay, later episode? why did I do that? Yes. A, okay. 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 Um, yes, and he explained he explained this in an interview that like yeah he wasn't sure why he did that and then he looked it up and he 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 read up on psychology and then he had he analyzed what he did and then realized okay that's what that meant. So my question is though, um, if there was no psychological element to the show, uh, does that that scene with the birds does it is it suddenly bereft of meaning? No. Uh, I agree. It, it still has meaning. Even if the creator wasn't conscious, even if they weren't cognizant 
of why they did it, I still think it has meaning. I mean, See, I don't, I, I don't need a, a, a psychology subtext within the show for symbolism to make sense. I agree. I, I'm But, just saying like that's how the show itself went about it. But I, I'm, I'm trying to posit that like, yeah, you don't need that in order for the scene to have meaning. The creator doesn't need to be fully aware of why they did something for it to have meaning. No, I feel like also, um, surely there are scenes in The Sopranos, like maybe Tony watches, you know, a squirrel or something that doesn't need to have like a psychological element to it, which he can build on later. Um, and if he's maybe. like, if you're writing the scene about like, hey, why were like the psychiatrist asks, why were you watching the birds, Tony? Um, if you, If you can't <laughs> come up with something, he could surely just like... Well, I won't have him ask about the birds. I'll have the psychologist ask about um, something else. So it's it's more like building on top of something and giving it meaning rather than it not having any meaning. Does that make sense? Um, I think I see what you're saying. But like at the same time, if something is in a work, it's usually there for a meaning. Like it's usually there for a reason. Yeah, usually. That's that's something that I needed to understand about movies. Or, well, I guess any any sort of art form really is nothing nothing in a professional production happens randomly, right? Yeah. Like everything is planned. So if you have a shot of Tony looking at a scroll, someone put that there. Someone filmed that. S someone see. put that on the editing timeline for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but uh, see, the, I, I, I get what you're saying, but you remember how Breaking Bad ended, like, do you remember? The, I've never the, seen it. The first episode of season of the final season, they just put that scene there, and they had no idea how they were gonna get get to it again. So like, it. Okay. You, I'm. I'm hmm. But that's just continuous I, I, I writing. Take, Yeah, but I, I take umbrage with the idea that it's all planned out. No, um, we're, because... not, we're not necessarily... No, that's... See, I'm not necessarily saying that it's all intentionally planned out. But so, I, what the point that we're trying to make is, or at least that I'm trying to make is, sometimes a scene is put there for a reason, even if the person putting it there doesn't... Them, they themselves don't know what the reason is. Yeah, okay. okay. But, also, Cause, uh, cause like, well, but also in your example, Asa, they put that scene there... Or it sounds to me like that. They put that scene there. They didn't know what they were going to do with it, but they knew they no, were going to do yeah, something yeah, yeah. with it. So they yeah, had so an intent. It was, yeah. it was that, there for a reason, but they just didn't know what that reason was yet. But what I'm, what I would say then, um, that's a good dis differentiation. Do we know with the bird example uh, specifically, did he intend to do something with it or did he just have that scene there originally as like, You just had a big shoot up and now Tony is just sitting in the park. We need to just like juxtapose the violence with something a bit calmer. So now Tony's no, just going to okay. watch birds for like, did it serve no, that's total not, purposes that's not or no, no, my, my point is just, did it serve a purpose other than just being a scene? Was it like, did it slow down the pacing? Was it just like, you know, Was it originally it was, doing one thing and then you build on top of it? Or was it just literally a random scene completely devo devoid of, you know, connective tissue to the rest of the show, which was then given meaning? Okay, so throughout that episode, um, Tony had been interacting with a duck that was, uh, it was a duck or a bird or something that was in his pool. Um, I think the, the, the bird was injured and... Uh, was just chilling in his pool and Tony had grown a bit of a, a connection with the bird and was like feeding it, taking care of it. Um, and then eventually towards the end of the episode, it, it, it just, it goes off on its own. Hmm. Um, and, and then that's when he saw the, the flock flying in the air. And then that's when, and then he, he had, um, a panic attack because he has an he a, a problem that Tony has. He has like these, these anxiety attacks where he just passes out. So right. the technically that episode had been building up 
in some small way to that scene. Uh, but obviously you wouldn't know what that scene is until you get to it. Uh, so it's not completely random, but like I've been saying, David Chase said that he, he wasn't fully cognizant of why he put that there, but he just, he felt a compulsion. He felt like it, it fit and he, he felt like he should put it there. He just wasn't fully aware why he felt that way. Sure. Yeah. But even if he just put that there, as Asa said, to have a, a break in the pacing, that's still intent. And then if yeah, you that, that, if you've that worked with bird Im imagery in that episode before, then sure, have Tony yeah. watch a flock of birds. Yeah, I mean it's been a while since I saw the first episode, so I'm like flip flopping on like was it a duck? Was it I, 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 my bad <laughs> on that? But yeah, it 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 wasn't like completely completely random. Mm -hmm. um, and what's actually really interesting is. There's another episode called College, which is considered like one of the best Sopranos episodes where uh, after Tony kills some guy, he looks up in the sky and he sees a, another flock of birds flying. And I thought that was I, I thought that was always really interesting because a lot of that episode was Tony with his daughter, um, Tony and his daughter interacting with each other. Uh, they were opening up to each other, but then he he found this guy who was a snitch, and he had he had to go out of his way to like take care of this problem, and then after he does so, sees the birds. So for me, I took that as like okay, there's a connection here between like his job and his family. There's like a disconnect between the two, uh, his family life and his mafia life. And I think that's represented in the birds in that scene as well, especially since, um, you know, how, how, it, how similar it looked to how it did in the first episode. Mm. Okay, I have another think, interesting... Oh, sorry, Ezra. But yeah, well, I was just going to say, um, a, a, a work can speak through a person and say more than, they, than the person knew that they were trying to say. And that seems yes. like that seems like that's what's happening here. Um. Yeah, Bogan. Yeah, I have another interesting example that I think you guys have seen that video too, of the director of Shazam, talking about the realities of making a movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah where specifically that, at good. the end, he brings up an example where um, there's a scene where the kids and the family like they go outside, and then they. They, they see something outside and they're like, no, actually, like, I think the, the main character is missing and then everyone wants to go outside and help search. But then they're like, no, actually, we should get back inside and only one character is going to go search. And um, he talks about like, well, we actually did this because of scheduling issues and the one like we didn't have whatever, like. There was one character who was very slow at getting dressed to go outside. And mm -hmm. so then w when they shot the outside shot, that character was missing. And they basically improvised that that she was so slow um, because they didn't have her on the day where they shot the outside shots. Mm -hmm. So they just wrote that in like, oh, she's, she's actually too slow to getting dressed. And that's why she's not in those shots. It was a completely production issue why mm. she wasn't there. But then he kind of mocks critics at the end where they're like, well, actually that character at the end of, of the film gets the superpower of super speed. And that is totally a mirror of how she was the slowest in getting dressed. Yeah, I remember. And he in, in that shot, he was like, oh, yeah, sure. Totally. Yeah, that's, that's totally that's what totally... we're going for. Is, yeah. is, and this is the interesting question, I guess, is the drawing the connection as a critic is is that invalidated by the author saying no that's not what we were going for at all um i i don't care what he says so yeah yeah it's see i'm on i think you can definitely read too much into a work i don't know if you've ever been on the subreddit uh movie details i think that's that's an example of people <laughs> They will take literally anything and draw any connection that they can. Where it's like, 
oh well the first time they met it was it was in the early of it was early in the morning to represent like the beginning of the day but when they broke up it was <laughs> night to represent like it's like maybe mm-hmm. it was just uh, the fucking day maybe not everything like not everything needs to be resonant to some main theme yeah and that seems like an example of that where it's like no, it just it's just how it happens that the character who was slow because of production issues got super speed. No, that's just, you know, it, oops, sure. it's just random. The the way I see, for, for me, I see it more like I think you can draw any conclusions that you want as long as they make sense. And obviously that's going to be on a very case by case basis. That's also from person to person. It's it's also very subjective. But like me personally, just hearing this thing with Shazam where like, oh, the little girl was too slow and then she got superpowers and that means something, that for me isn't super compelling. Even though I just said, oh, I don't care what the director says, and I don't, but at the same time, I don't find that read to be particularly interesting or compelling. Yeah, that's but, that's where I would maybe draw a distinction because I would also say that is like, that is a, a little nice detail that some, maybe someone would think they picked out of that movie it's not really that impactful at if, if it was intended it's like a nice little uh bit of foreshadowing mm-hmm. okay sure yeah. and if then the author comes in and says no that's we weren't just going for that at all uh then i guess that is invalidated but at the same time say i don't know someone reads something into a work where they feel some aspect of their life uh really mirrored like this character is going through whatever. There's a scene where they're going through a security control or something. And someone, I don't know, maybe maybe a black person feels like it's it's way more threatening to go through a security control. And, and they have a special like experience w- with that sort of situation that is not intended mm-hmm. to be in that scene. But the black person reads that into that scene. And like yeah. and, and that, I don't know. I feel like that is more impactful. Where there's so much now personal um, experience put into that analysis, where it doesn't even matter what the author was going for. It's just it it comes back around to being an expression of the critic who reads something into a scene, even if it wasn't intended. But it's still like sure. a worthwhile uh, observation. Sure. Um, I will say though, I, agree. I, I agree. will say though, on um, on the other side of that, uh, while I I do agree with you, but I think I I still I'm on the boat that um, reading, you know, bringing too much of yourself to the evaluation of something. I think I I always like to go back and have like the creator's intent as like the baseline, because. If, for example, you just, you hate English as a language, you hate it with every fiber of your being, then congratulations, and like, if you bring that hatred with you when you watch English movies or play English games, and you hate them for that, that says nothing about the game, and way more about you. Uh, And I feel like it's very unfair to evaluate, say, you know, let's go with Citizen Kane. It's very unfair to say Citizen Kane is a bad movie because I hate the English language. A, a ridiculous sure. example, I know. But um, I, I'm always very reticent about bringing... T- I, I think there's real value in your experience of a movie or of a game. But I also think that it doesn't nullify the creator's intent... Uh, I think they sort of have to... I think they exist s- both separately, kind of. When you can appreciate both as, like, separate. Where, like... Mm. T- take, like, Zack Snyder's movies. I've talked about this before. I I, I can recognize that he isn't Kubrick. Like, I, I, I watch his movies, and I know, like... I Don't they're... don't worry. I don't think anyone <laughs> in their right mind would be making that comparison. <laughs> my, my or po- making like... that... Or, or, or confusing them. A lot of, uh, like, if you read, like, the critical, like, appraisal of his movies, it's usually, like, it's usually pretty damning on him. And I can look at those critiques and I can say, well, yeah, he he has a really hard time with interpersonal relationships 
they're very shallow. Um, I can look at all those sort of standard baseline critiques of a movie, apply them to his works and say, I understand why people say he's a bad filmmaker, but I can put that aside and say, there's just something about, I don't know, the ambience or whatever of his movies, which always kind of hooks me in. So like, I, I really enjoyed Batman v Superman just on a personal level, even though I can put on my other hat and say, well, obviously this, this is, there's a lot of problems with how this movie is, you know, assembled. Um, so that's kind of the other well, I think, side of it. I mean, yeah, I, th- I feel like that's a separate topic of like, yeah, you know, what you like and dislike versus what you, your what you think makes something good or bad, which are, I true. That, true. That's a totally different thing. Um, so I was thinking about how, so I want to kind of bring it back a little bit to the psychology angle. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to create this scenario. So let's say you have an author and he writes a book where the main character gets bullied. And that's like the main point of the book. It's just this story about this kid that gets bullied. And according to the author, though, they say, oh, I've never been bullied. This is just a story I came up with. But then what if, and this is not based on a real thing. I'm making this up, just to be clear. Were you bullied because you're a weep? Are you still being bullied because you're a weep? (laughs) I'm being bullied right now. by you getting bullied (laughs) every every second week. Uh, (laughs) But let's say... Let's say, for example, that this author actually was bullied, but the trauma was such that they repressed those memories and they don't remember being bullied anymore. Yet here they are writing this book about being bullied. So I would say in that instance, it doesn't really matter of what the author's intentions were, it's pretty obvious that they are saying something about their own personal experience about being bullied, even if they weren't fully aware that they themselves were bullied and that they're writing about it. Even if that person wasn't bullied, that doesn't invalidate writing a story about bullying. Sure. No, I just, I just think that I'm just using this example specifically because I just think it's, um, I think the psycho like I, I think people underestimate how our unconscious minds are like influencing how we craft these stories and how like we are imbuing things with meaning even when we're not fully aware of it ourselves. And I think that's how we get situations like in The Sopranos where David Chase is like, I'm going to put this flock of birds here. I don't know why, but you know, I'm going to put it here. And they're and that's tied to this like deeper more psychological reason that we're not fully aware of any mm-hmm. thoughts on that i mean yeah, I, I said difficult. like i said earlier a good work like a work can say more through you than you ever intended it to yes i uh, you said that earlier which i think is correct yeah but um it's difficult to yeah. assess this if it's really subconsciously happening yeah see so, th- so that I, specific that... example because like I, I don't know like th- that doesn't explicitly deal with the intent of the author like they didn't intend to talk about bullying i suppose but i don't know they may be like they still did i feel like authorial intent the question should I don't know if authorial intent matters in that case because they didn't intend to talk about it. I think it's authorial intent maybe matters more when there clearly is uh, intentions on their part. Okay. Well, another example I have, this is actually a real example. Um, I'm sure you guys know who Cliffy B is. Didn't he? You guys do know Cliffy B, right? He made Lawbreakers. He did. He also made Gears of War. Oh, Cliff Mm. Burton. Is that his name? Uh, Cliff Brzezinski, Brzezinski? isn't it? Brzezinski? Yes. Oh. Yes. So, um, when I was reading the book Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, um, apparently, I, I. it's been a while since I read that book, but 
if I got this right, um, when Cliffy B was a kid, he is a really big fan of the game Blaster Master. And I think around that time, he was dealing with some family issues. I think maybe his parents were getting divorced, something like that. Don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% on that. But I think he was dealing with some uh, domestic problems, some, some problems with his family at the time. And I, his way to cope was Blaster Master. Um, and apparently when he was making Gears of War... He unwittingly um, wanted the, the 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 graphics designers to make the tanks look exactly like the tank from Blaster Master. Totally unintentional on his part. He didn't realize it until it was pointed out to him, and then he was like, "Holy shit, this is the Blaster Master tank!" And he he just totally didn't realize it. So. I think that's interesting. I think that, you know, and and I think, again, it, 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 I think it questions what we think about when we think about authorial intent and like, you know, the, again, our unconscious minds are like working in weird ways and they, they're, they're manifesting in ways that we don't really understand. And again, like what Acer said before, our works tend to say things about us in ways that, you know, we were, we don't intend and, and it's, I, I just think it's really uh, yeah sure i mean remember when like a couple of days ago when i wrote in our discord like if i was a writer i wanted to to write a villain who doesn't say anything and then at the end comes out as, as somewhat relatable and rational and then mm -hmm. as i was typing it typing it i was like like as i kept going on in my head i was like oh wait i, I guess i'm just writing letho from the witcher 2 mm. because i yes. really like that villain and it's, uh, of course, that influenced me and that just, I, I watched another villain in another game and I was like, ah, I wish this, subconsciously, I guess, I wish, I was like, I wish this was more like Letho from The Witcher 2. Mm. I think, uh, I th so if we look at like Discord or making movies, if we just look at it as very abstracted forms of communication, um, like you speak with the, you know, the frames of a movie, you speak through a video game, you can speak with music. I think speaking is a very important part of thinking because sentences, like for me, I don't think of a sentence and then just start talking about it. I have like a vague instinct for where I want my, uh, my thoughts to go and what I want to say, but I find that in the speaking of it is how I make it. So like when, when I write a video, for example, when I'm writing a script, I'll have a note that says, talk about the item degradation. This is like shadow tower. And I'll just start typing. And I don't, I don't have, you know, I don't have a full sentence in my head. When I begin typing, I just begin talking. And it's, it's like, it's like speaking. It just, it comes out as an extension of the original thought. And mm -hmm. I'll, just as much thinking goes into the saying as saying goes into it, if that makes sense. No, and yeah, I, think this, I, I, I relate to what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, and I think that goes to uh, with the birds in The Sopranos, which is like you are saying something, you may not understand fully what you're saying, but you do on some level you you know what like you put that in there because you understood that you needed to say something and you understood what you like you there is some part of you that is trying to say this and then mm -hmm. you say it and then you think back on it and then you go oh i get what i was saying yeah i mean and then then, then yeah. maybe as you're typing it out you realize oh i guess this doesn't make as much as much sense or maybe this aspect yeah. I wanted to talk about doesn't even matter. Like that's yeah. that's how I write my scripts and my arguments too often is I have a basic idea of what I want to express and then I just start typing and me I'm I'm just figuring out the way to get to the conclusion where I already am. But it's just yeah. adding more and more steps of explanation until I'm satisfied that this this is all the information that the viewer basically needs to follow me. 
and, and that, of course, is me also realizing that thought in greater detail than I already had. Yeah. So, and I do think it's it's prudent to point out though that like for us, our creative process is not the same as making a movie. It's not <clears> the same <throat> as making a game, or at least most games, because we are fully in control of what we create. We are, you know, the writers, um, and we we you know. It's not have, a collaborative effort. Right. And I think when, when things get messy with uh, something like a video game or like a movie, is that everyone may not necessarily be on the pa same page. And even if you could get people to be on the same page as much as possible, everyone's still going to have a slightly different version of whatever they're creating in their head. Like, mm -hmm. they all have a slightly different interpretation of it. So... I think it gets even messier in that regard of like, okay, what was the intent? Well, you ask one person, you might get one answer. You ask another person, they might give you a different answer. And, you know, some people might say like, oh, well, just ask the writer or the director. But like, even then it's like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the two of them yeah. are going to agree. Because like, even then, then you, yeah, then you have the editor who's like, no, no, no. When I assembled those two, those, those, these two scenes together, I did it for my reasons, not the reasons that the director filmed them for. Yeah, you also have situations like Blade Runner where uh, yeah. <laughs> Ridley Scott uh, thinks that uh, Decker is a replicant and the writer doesn't. Doesn't fucking understand yeah. his own movie. It's so funny. And and uh, and Harrison Ford doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the greatest example of fuck you and your authorial intent. Uh, yeah, and, and Blade, yeah. I think Blade Runner is a fucking great movie. You know, either way, I don't, I don't care. No, it's a worse, it's fucking... a worse movie if De if if Deckard is a replicant. It's just no, straight I, up I agree. a worse Deckard story. Is not a repli no, I agree. He's not a replicant. I I fully dis. I don't agree with Ridley Scott at all. I think he's full of shit. But like, no, yeah, it's it's like, regardless, like, Blade Runner is a great fucking movie. Regardless of what uh, Ridley Scott fucking intended. Yeah. It's like, f fuck you, Ridley Scott. I don't care what you think. Yeah, and, and that kind of goes into the other side of when you have, like, a lot of people working on it. Another great example is Empire Strikes Back, which is when you have so many creative people working together on something, they're going to... And if, like, if they have good chemistry, whether or not they agree with each other they can probably produce something together which is better than any one of them could have put together by themselves. So, like, yeah, Ridley Scott may not fully recognize why Deckard being a replicant, he may not fully be able to articulate or understand why that's bad or whether that's good, but I bet you there is some aspect of the movie which Ridley Scott can articulate in a way that the writer just can't. Yes. And there, then there's going to be something Harrison Ford, like, act playing the character, or you could have it even in, you know, Empire Strikes Back, or or you could even do, uh, Star Wars is actually a good example, because George Lucas, he's a really good producer, and he's a really good sort of executive creative consultant guy, but he is so bad at, like, he's he's a bad director, He's bad at bad interacting writer. with people. He's a bad writer. He's a bad editor. His great skill is he can, he he can like abstract. He's really good at like abstracting very appealing concepts. Like he he can take them. Like he he knows what resonates with people, and mm -hmm. he can merge them and abstract them in a way. And he can take like samurai movies and westerns and Flash Gordon, and he can create Star Wars. But he needs Harrison Ford. He needs Alec Guinness. He needs Lawrence Kasdan. He needs all yeah. of these creative people to because because focus. he's such because he's such an awkward motherfucker that like yeah. the dialogue that he writes are like these uh, cumbersome like nonsense lines that d that are not things humans would say. Yeah, and I, I I remember an interview where where Mark Hamill was like, I refuse to say this line. Like it was a very, it was like this weird line 
And and Mark Hamill's like, no, fuck you, George. I'm not saying this line. This is not the way humans talk. Get this shit out of my like, face. I'm uh, not doing it. Like like Harrison Ford famously said to George Lucas's face when they were filming, I think, A New Hope. George, you can write this shit, but you sure as shit can't say it. <laughs> but, and and that's like, but see, that's the that's such a that's such a great example because when he has to fight with people and he has to consult with them and they all need to work together to refine these ideas, you get Empire Strikes Back. But when George Lucas has full creative control and everybody around him is a yes man, you get Attack of the Clones. Ah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. But like, I've said this before on the podcast, I think when we did the commentaries, the Star Wars commentaries, um, I think the prequel trilogy... That is a really good story told very poorly. I think mm, if George okay. had been in the same situation where he had like different directors and script writers and actors who were willing to fight him, that same story, like just that as a story of how the original trilogy happens, where you have like you have this, um, you have a continual decline of constitutional republicanism in the galaxy. Because you have this war and it's being waged by both sides by the Sith. And you have Anakin Skywalker become more and more just disillusioned with the Jedi when the war shows him that the the ways of the Jedi, they don't work. And you have these you have these, you know, sterile, unsexed monks in their ivory tower making these proclamations about a world that they don't understand. They don't live in the real world. And obviously he's going to join the Sith because the alternative is being one of these crazy Jedi. They're no better and they're so incapable of dealing with this. Like just the the story on a macro scale makes so much sense. And when you put it into the hands of Dave Filoni and the Clone Wars crew or uh, uh, Gendy Tarakowski, who did the original Clone Wars... Yeah. Gendy Taratovsky. When you make, uh, I think her name is Claudia Gray, who wrote Master and Apprentice, which I talked about um, a few months back, or James Lucino, who did the Plagueis books. When you, when different people get to tell this story, it's really good. But it's just him specifically, he doesn't have the words to tell it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he... George Lucas is at his best when he's working with people that challenge him and are able to take his ideas into directions that he would yeah. never do. Yeah. He's also at his best when he uh, edits the original trilogy just to, <laughs> to say fuck with people. <laughs> uh. But yeah. Um, is, is there anything else about this particular topic that we want to um, like bring up or... Because I think we've reached a, like a pretty good conclusion. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. It's okay. a it's a difficult topic to talk about, right? It's um, of course, it matters and it doesn't matter. It all all, all, uh, all, de all depends on the example and who and is it depends involved. On, it depends on what you mean by matter in what context. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I get. Yeah, I mean. I made it kind of vague uh, intentionally so that it, it could we could talk about it in, in multiple different directions. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate your guys' input because it is different from mine. I, I'm still of the opinion that like, yeah, I, I don't give a shit what the, what the uh, authors say for the most part, but you know, I, t I, I think you guys make, you, you know, you guys brought up some interesting points. Yeah, I, I just yeah. personally, I, I don't really care about it that much. I also tend to mm -hmm. not look into behind the scenes stuff as much. I ignore trailers and all that. Um, but yeah. that's, of course, not saying that it, that it doesn't matter. I mean, one of the enjoyable aspects of watching like a bad movie is trying to understand what they were trying to do and then mm -hmm. realizing how it came out. Right, that's that's mm. always funny, but for me, uh, I I when I go into authorial intent, it's usually like to confirm a suspicion I have or something, like the mm. the the Filbert show and Bojack Horseman, where I always had the suspicion this is this is basically 
the writers of Bojack commenting on their own show. And then I just looked up yeah. if I can find evidence of them saying that. And I did. Mm. Yeah, I, I got that vibe as well when I was watching. It's like, oh, yeah, this is the creators commenting on their own show. Yeah. And uh, and the, the audience reaction to, like, BoJack and how they were, <laughs> how people were, like, um, clinging to his character in a way that they were like, no, that's that's not what we want, but... Huh. Yeah, eh, very interesting. Um, all right, so uh, Acer, I have not seen your Bloodborne video yet because Coward. it's like eight, eight hours long. No, no, right? it's seven and a half. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's going to take me a while to get through. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't funny. have much to say about it. It's not supposed, I don't think it's supposed to be watched as like in a single sitting. I think it's a video. Those are the kind of videos when I have like, I like to put those videos on in the background when I just need like ambience. Um, I did, however, go through your exploring the story of Bloodborne where you had like um, some other creators with you. I thought that was really fun. I enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Um, I think you should do something like that again. I thought I thought it was a nice little thing where I treated it more like a podcast because you you uh, kind of is, had like kinda. the visuals uh, mostly just recycled. So I I was just like oh I'm gonna just listen to this while I'm doing something else and I enjoyed I, uh, that. That was a nice little podcast type of thing. Do you know? Uh, do you know? Want to know something? I am. You said I should do more like that. I am gonna do something like that. Uh, I'm gonna do it. So, um, when does this episode come out? Like, a month from now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, Maria, Eurothuk, uh, and I, oh. and Ragnarox, um, oh. kind of work, I'm kind of trying to rope us together, trying to find a good time to have, like, a conversation about Silent Hill. Because I want to do another Silent Hill video, which most people subscribe to my channel for that, but I'm not... I'm not in the headspace to do another commentary, so I'm gonna try to do that to, to sort of tide people over. Also, because it's less editing. <laughs> well, the the next one you would have to do a commentary on would be Silent Hill Four, I would imagine. Yes. What a coincidence! I just uploaded a video about Silent Hill Four. Oh, a month ago when this comes out. <laughs> but yeah, basically. <laughs> but it was so, still good. <laughs> thank you. Um, I had been tinkering with it for a while. And I'm pretty happy with how it came out. Um, responsive and pretty positive. So that's pretty cool. Um, Boken, have you seen it yet? Yeah, I have. I liked okay, it. Okay. Uh, Cool. Oh, but, um, I'm well, kind of yeah. curious because you never, I imagine you never played the game. No, I did not. Uh, Although it does it sound like a cool game. Well, I knew a couple of things about the game already. So, yeah, it was just, I mean, I, I knew what the game was about, basically. Okay, cool. Mm. So, it, no, it wasn't so, that hard to follow. Like the, right, the, the theme, the, the, the overarching theme that you're talking about is... It's pretty clear. So the biggest reason why I wanted to make that video is because whenever anyone talks about Silent Hill 4, it's the same fucking talking points every time. Yep. yep. And I saw it's... I saw one comment uh, in your video where somebody where somebody said it. Literally word for word, the exact same talking points. And well, I don't. I, I don't consider it like a part of the Silent Hill. Uh, Silent Hill. I consider it separate. You mean that one? Um, I don't want to call anyone out specifically. So. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, it's usually just people complaining about the flaws of the game and people complaining about it's not a real quote-unquote Silent Hill game. So yeah, I. I, this is not to say that no one has ever like talked about what the game in any substance or depth, but just that whenever conversation 
of the game comes up, it is almost universally, oh, the second half of the game sucks. It turns into a, a, an escort mission. And it's like, yeah. can we just... Can we talk about something else? So <laughs> it's yeah, it's like Silent Hill Four is way better than the than the general like people like when people talk about Silent Hill Four, it's usually negative. It is way mm. better than the negative mm. miasma around it would have you believe. It's yes. not as good. I don't think it's as refined. I should say not as good. It's not as refined as its predecessors. But yes. it does some pretty bold things that the predecessors didn't. I totally agree. Um, now somebody's uh, I, somebody's drilling into the, into my apartment now. Can you hear it? Actually, I can't. But uh, it's okay. Um, so it's yeah, gonna like, show up on my audio. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the main thing I wanted to do with the video was like, I'm, I I wanted to just focus on okay, what is this game? getting across you know or what's my read on the game you know more specifically like what did i take from this game because like when i first played this game it had a pretty big effect on me and it's like we're in 2021 since the game came out like well, like 15 years ago something like that um and i'm still thinking about it and mm -hmm. it, it has to be because there's more to this game then the fact that the second half of the game is a fucking escort mission. <laughs> so I wanted to really like focus on um, the symbolism. I wanted to really focus on uh, the the subtext and all that. And uh, hopefully I did a decent job. Because, man, I'm just, yeah, sick and tired of the same <laughs> shit over and over again. Yeah. yeah um, I'm glad you two liked it. That's good to hear. Uh, are you guys working on anything else? Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm trying to rope. Uh, I'm trying to put together that Silent Hill chat. I'm also making That's a right. video on Shadow Tower, as I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Right now, I finished recording it, uh, and I've I'm like halfway through editing it. I think I'm gonna cut it by like five minutes. I think I can make it a bit more concise. Uh, and I want to fact check a couple of things, but that should be out a few days from now. Probably will okay. have been out f like for like a month when people are listening to this. <laughs> uh, and also is my last Guardian video. Finally, uh, I think I I, I kind of regret not having done that before doing Bloodborne as like a cap off to like my Team Eco stuff. But better late mm. than never, I say. Sure. What about you, so Bogan? Yeah, still uh, the Bojack video should be done fairly soon, actually. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what I want to do after that, though. Kind of... Okay. I'm not too enthused about any particular idea that I have. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, well, hopefully you come up with something. What if I don't? But, yeah. What if I'm done? <gasps> I guess you're dead. What if I'm I'm all well, out then of, you on, have... all out of things to say? Then you can just edit the podcast for us for the rest <laughs> of your life. You can always do that. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. Bogan's just like not having it. Um so I think I'm gonna next video might be Zysteria part three, which if I'm being honest, I'm not super excited to release just because I think it'll be the most boring part because <laughs> I decided to make that part uh, about the progression systems, which unless you're like a hyper nerd, you're probably not going to care too much about. But at the same time, the, the progression systems in that game are so fucking jank. I couldn't just not talk <laughs> about them. You should do and a video... Um... Sorry to interrupt, and sorry sure. to tell you what you should make a video on. I, I don't like when people do that to me. Well, you should do a... I, I value your opinion, so go ahead. Okay. Have you ever thought about doing a video on... Uh, on uh, it's an it, So there's an anime called School Days, which ends pretty uh, horribly. Have you thought about doing mm. a video <laughs> on that? 
that, uh, is that really 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 uh, uh that's my that's where my energy is right though that's not that is not the that is not what i expected you to say <laughs> no i was i just uh i was trying to be funny um but yeah so part three and then part four will be the final part where i talk about the story which i i'm super not looking forward to that because that means i have to like re fresh myself on the story and i don't want to do that because i think it has like one of the worst stories in the fucking (laughs) series so yeah anyways aside from that um i i also wanted to do that video on scott pilgrim so hopefully yeah it, you know, it would make sense for me to do a video on Scott Pilgrim now because Scott Pilgrim all of a sudden has become a thing and people who care about Scott Pilgrim again all of a sudden. <laughs> but knowing my dumb bitch ass, I'm, I'm going to fucking not do it and just like procrastinate on it. No. Um, do it. Yeah. I also have another idea for a video where I had mentioned you were not here for this episode, Acer, but I had an idea for... You did an episode without me? Yeah, that's the episode we did with the playing field, yeah. Jared. We did two, um, actually. I mentioned, I, I mentioned that I played a game called Sagebrush, and uh, I have been learning about cults and shit, and I have started realizing, like, oh, okay, Sagebrush had been, like, inspired by all these different cults. So I thought it might be an interesting video to like just talk about all the cult influences of the game and how like all some of the different ideas in the game and how the cult works is similar to Jonestown, Children of God, um, Heaven's Gate. Hmm. I'd watch um, that video. Yeah, Om Shinrikyo, like all these different cults. So yeah, I thought that might be something interesting but yeah that's all I, that's all i've got and i think that's all we've got so i hope you enjoyed this has been yet another episode of wait, the essays wait we didn't tell what? them what uh what next week's uh topic is gonna be oh fuck <laughs> what we oh, don't even okay, know what, i was gonna say what then what is it you cow! You idiots! We're gonna do the Avatar commentary next week, aren't we? Uh, I guess. Okay, maybe. I guess that might be the next episode. Uh, yes, sure. but that's not. You have to make a recommendation. You, I, was, still, I yeah, said you... Yu-Gi-Oh season zero. I guess. Okay, I guess we're doing Yu-Gi-Oh season zero as well. Is for that the next really? A, you said that's not a good choice. No, I said that's not a good choice uh, in that I hadn't watched it, didn't I? Yeah. Anyway, I talked to my friend about it, and he was like, no, no, it's it's just an adaptation of the manga. And if that's the case, I think it's a good choice. Well, good enough for me. Okay. Uh, I guess so... we're going to be doing Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero. Cool ah, beans. Ah, ah, ah. You fools. That means... You know what that means. What does it mean? It means we're also going to watch Darling in the Franks. Wait, really? Yeah, that's the the agreement. Well, maybe not that. Maybe I find another horrible show to torture you guys with. See, Daniel... that is the agreement. Daniel, here's the thing. I made an agreement with Bogan that he he agrees to Yu-Gi-Oh! I'll agree to whatever crap he agrees to. I am telling you now... If you, I will break my contract with Bogan <laughs> if no, you, you say <laughs> if you say yes to Yukio. But Daniel, you get nothing in exchange except not having to watch Starling in the Franks. <laughs> I mean, I kind of want to watch Starling in the Franks yeah. out of morbid I'm, curiosity. I'm also, I'm just, I'm, I'm joking. Bogan and I, we've had this deal for way too long to start breaking it now. Yeah, I mean, I, I at this point, I'm kind of like, I want to see what kind of a trash fire it is, so. Yeah. Okay. That, that's going to be fun in quotation marks. God damn it. It's been three hours. End the episode, Daniel. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.